studies at Howard University, and also Vanessa, Dr. Vanessa Oyugi, who's the co-director of outreach at the Center for African Studies. Uh, we have adjusted our schedule this morning to include uh, Dr. Siddiqui's language presentation that was disrupted Tuesday uh, by a tropical storm. And here in Washington, DC, the sun is shining beautifully here. Uh, she's in Annapolis, which is not that far away. And don't you know, it's raining. <laughs> and she's getting a lot of rain, but we, we're trying to work it out so that we think that this is all gonna work today. Uh, uh, after um, uh, Dr. Uh, Siddiqui's language presentation, she actually is going to be continuing to do uh, another presentation with Dr. Bai Chang, and they will be discussing the medieval West African epics. And that will be followed by a Q&A by our moderator, Dr. Helen Bond, who's been with us the past few days. Um, afterwards, we're going to have a break for about 10 minutes. And when we come back, Dr. Jean Tongara will do her presentation on using myths, legends, and lyrics to understand the African past. After her Q&A, that'll be time for you to go into a breakout room and share the connections, what, what you did, wrote, or what you drew last night uh, about uh, your connection to the Gold Road. Uh, after that, we will come together back to the Institute to share, and you can share the connections with the Institute. Uh, then we will complete the final evaluation. Uh, we uh, have been, some people have been asking about recordings or access to uh, PowerPoint presentations. We have been recording the Institute and we hope to provide access via our website, uh, hopefully um, today or tomorrow. We're working on that. Just remember with the Zoom guidelines, mute yourself and stop your video uh, during presentations that, that will improve the sound quality. And I will now briefly uh, reintroduce Dr. Asada Siddiqui. Uh, she is the Associate Professor of French and Francophone Literatures at the US Naval Academy. She is the author of Recreating Words and Reshaping Worlds, The Verbal Art of Women in Mali, Niger, and Senegal. She also co-authored two books, Women's Voices from West Africa and Women's Songs from West Africa. And she has also published several journal articles on various issues. So now join me in welcoming Dr. Um, Aisada Siddiqui. Thank you, Brenda. And thank you for the team of the Center of African Studies at Howard. So today I'm going to talk about the Songhai Zarma, actually the Zarma language, but today it's the same um, uh, denomination. So um, like I said last time, one cannot talk about a language without mentioning or showing the people. Um, so the people who speak the Songhai language, and the pronunciation is Songhai or Songhai. Uh, for instance, I, my background is Songhai Zarma, so we say Songhai actually, but you hear people saying the Songhai. Here I have, um, if you could see, um, I have uh, ways of saying the Songhai. The Songhai, the Songhai Zarma, the Songhai, the Songhai, uh, same pronunciation, different way of writing it. The Zarma, you have the Jarma. The Jarma, this, um, this uh, is the French um, uh, way of saying the Zarma. The Zabarma that you see, for instance, um, in, in Hausa regions of Niger. And uh, the Zerma, which is also in Niger. The Djerma, again, another way for the French to write it. The Zabarmawa, which is, um, Again, Northern uh, Hausa in Nigeria, the Dendi in Benin, the Tassawak, the Koiraboro, and you see, I say, et cetera, because there are many ways of referring to the Songhai people or Zarma people. So on my map, you see that I have um, uh, uh, this line from Timbuktu in Mali all the way to Northern Nigeria here. So, um, because of geographical reasons and because um, the empire of um, Askia Mohammed goes all the way to this place, you see it in Benin, 
So you have the Dendi that I have here, the Dendi or the Benin people who speak Zarma. When they speak, for instance, one can understand what they're saying, but the difference would be most of the time uh, uh, in the vocabulary. You also have Gao here, they speak Songhai. Songhai is spoken here. We all understand one another, but with some slight kind of differences. It goes all the way to Algeria. They are called the Kurache in Algeria. So that's basically the Zarma people. You have them also uh, in Togo, in Ghana, uh, because of Askia Mohammed's empire, but also because people travel at the end of the rainy season. A lot of people from this, um, from this region will travel, for instance, to Ghana, Togo, and also Benin. People travel and they stay, they never come back. So that's the Songhai. I just wanted you to have a little bit of idea about the traditional way the Songhai people dress. So when people, uh, for instance, like it, they will, they will put either gold or silver. If you know the, the, the history the, of the ancient uh, Songhai, um, gold and sil silver was plenty and they used to uh, sell it to um, Asia, Europe, and also uh, other African places. Here you see a couple, a man and a woman. They're probably just got married or maybe um, they were married a few days uh, before. And this is a young woman also. You can wear this uh, um, ornament if you want, or you can just leave your hair, you know, uh, open. Okay. The Songhai Zarma. So the people who speak Songhai Zarma live along the Niger River from Mali down to uh, Niger to northern Benin and northwestern Nigeria. The Zarma live on the left bank of the Niger River, from the Mali border south to northern uh, Benin. The linguistic unity of the world of the Songhai Zarma and a common cultural heritage are undeniable facts that include in one civilization all those who from the Masina to the Dendi speak the same language. The two peoples are often linked under the term Songhai Zarma. So that's what you will see today. Uh, unless somebody doesn't know, you will see uh, people referring to the Songhai or to the Zarma, and it doesn't matter. Um, according to their oral history, the Zarma migrated from Mali and throughout the region after the death of Emperor Askia Mohammed in 1538. Actually, he came out of the power uh, in 1528, but he died in 1538. They were led by Mali Beho. Uh, Mali the Great, and they first settled in Western Niger where there are farmers, potters, weavers, blacksmiths, traders, politicians, uh, you name it. Their city-states were matriarchal and hierarchical. Today, both the Songhoi and Zarma societies are matrilineal, patriarchal, hierarchical, and mostly Islamic. They also practice their ancestral cults. So you can't see a Zarma without a um, hearing from, you know, without knowing that they, they, practice, they practice Islam, but they also practice their ancestral cult. Okay, so um, let's just talk about greetings in Songhai Zarma. So when you, when you hear Fofu, Fofu, or Wafofu, Matigoyo, these are greetings that, uh, you know, you hear all the time. They're very informal. When you say to me, Fofo, you're just saying uh, hello or hi. That's Fofo. So hello or hi. When you say Fofo also, Fofo means thank you. I give you something or you do something for me, I would say Fofo. When I say Wafofo, this is plural. I'm talking to a group. I'm talking to more than one person. So when I say wafofo, I'm addressing uh, 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 several people, wafofo. For one person, you just say fofo. When I say mate goyo, goyo means work. If I see you doing something, I would say mate goyo. The literal trans translation would be, how is work? 
or how is the work? So uh, you're passing by, you know that I work, you can ask me that question. And then I will move to the formal greetings in Shanghai Zahama. So in, in Shanghai Zahama, you could say, for instance, mate ni go. So when I say mate ni go, I'm talking to one person. How are you? Mate ni go. But when I say mate ahan go, mate ahan go, I'm talking to uh, uh, several people. In Shanghai Zarma, you can just forget. Um, you can just forget the mati. I can say nigo bani. When I say nigo bani, I'm saying, "Are you okay? Are you well? How are you?" So let me come back again here. When you say uh, mati nikani. Mate Nikani. So this morning I could say to Brenda, for instance, Brenda, Mate Ni Kani. How did you sleep? That's the literal translation, but it means good morning. So I would say Mate Ni Kani. If I'm talking to the whole group here today, I would say Mate Ahan Kani. Mate Ahan Kani. When I say Mate Ni Foy, Mate Ni Foy. So because I'm, I'm just uh, teaching, I'm saying mate ni foy. That's not how you pronounce it. You would say mate ni foy, mate ni kani, mate arangu. That's how you pronounce it. So mate ni foy, foy means good afternoon. But when you really translate it, it would say, how did you spend the day? Foy means um, day, okay? Foy means day. And four means also afternoon. Mate ni hire, mate ni hire, or mate aran hire means how did you spend the evening? Or how is your evening? So mate ni hire, mate ni fwe, mate ni kani, mate ni go, or mate aran go, mate aran kani, mate aran fwe, mate aran hire. To all these questions, for instance, you answer Bani Sami. So if I see you, I would say this morning, I will say, Matin Kani, you would say, you're supposed to answer to me, Bani Sami, Bani Sami. But the problem, well, it's not a problem. The thing is, in, in most, I will not say many, I don't know all African societies, but in West Africa, most African societies when you greet a person, you just say, hey, hello, and that's it. No. So when you say to me, or when I say to you, Matinigo, I would say, Bani Samai, and I would ask you, Matinigo, and you would say, Bani Samai as well. So you open the greetings, if I can say that, which means that um, we will continue to, to say, for instance, um, uh, Matifu. Fu means home. So I would say, since it's more, mate ni kani, bani samai, mate fu, I don't have fu here. So mate fu, how is home? I would say bani samai, tali kulsi, samai samai wallahi, and we will continue. And from this greeting or this one or this one, you answer bani samai, but then we'll continue uh, uh, um, to, 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 to greet one another, we will ask, uh, you know, about our husbands, our children, everything. So greetings take time uh, in in those societies. So when you travel, for instance, in one of those societies, depending on the language, you will have to ask about everybody, uh, just to show that you do care, you mean it, you're asking, and you want to know. So. This is matarankani, the way I was pronounced it first, matarankani, instead of mate arankani, matarankani. Um, now, when you, when you say hello to everybody, you want to say goodbye, you would say, these are goodbyes. So, uh, if you remember, we saw foy, that's the day, kani is in the morning. So, irma foy bani, after you finish the greetings, you would say, Okay, bye. Ir mufoy bani. So ir, ir, which is plural for 
as we ilmu faybani you're telling the person okay let's let's stay well ilmu faybani let's stay well okay ilmu faybani that's saying bye okay if this morning i saw somebody and i i i, I say matin kani we do all the greetings i would say uh uh ilma kanban okay now you can say also okay kalatantan kalatantan which means okay see you later kalatantan that's see you later talk to you later okay i will say kal suba see you tomorrow suba is tomorrow kal suba suba is tomorrow I don't know, but I'm wondering if the suba didn't come from Arabic. I'm not sure. One has to do the research. In Zama Songai, when you say B, you're talking about yesterday. When you say Hunkuna, Hunkuna, you're talking about today. Suba, you're talking about tomorrow. So B, Hunkuna, Suba. B, Hunkuna, Suba. Kal Suba, Kalatonton, Irma Kanbani, Irma Foybani. Now, for instance, uh, you all know that uh, uh, before we start uh, the, the greetings, uh, if you don't know me, you will ask for my name. So in Zarma Songhai, to ask for my name, you would say Mate Nima. Mate Nima. So if you notice, Mate can be how are you? And Mate Nima what is your name so how and what that's how we use them when you ask me mate nima i would say aima aisata aima aisata so you probably notice that ma is name in zama ma is also here in Z to hear aima i heard you so aima aisata mate nima aima aisata and then I will ask you your name, for instance. Uh, if I say to Brenda, Matinima, she will say, I'm a Brenda. So what's your name in Zarma is Matinima. The I is the I, like the I in English. I'm a Aisata, okay? So since we don't have much time uh, to go uh, over a lot of things, I have some things here, the Zamun, just you know, to enter the cultural realm of oral literature. Zamu. In Songhai Zarma, and it's not only in Songhai Zarma, in West Africa, we praise our children, we praise our mothers, we praise our husbands, wives, anybody. So for instance, this example they have for you, this is a praise song for either a newborn baby who's Zainab, it's like Zainab in Arabic, or um, this is just a praise song uh, created for a woman. So Zainab, she said, Zainab, Zainab is fire. Fire cannot be held in the hand. Zainab is hot pepper, and hot pepper cannot be held pinched between the teeth. You're the brew of Lolo. Your equal cannot dare to fall on you. So it tells you a lot of things here, what Zainab is. Zainab is not a person who let anybody walk all over her. She is fire, and we know fire burn. Um, I will not spend a lot of time here. You can email me if you have, if you want to ask me any question. If I know the answer, I will uh, uh, respond to you if you want. So this is a praise song, uh, for instance, and each name has a song that um, is created by either the mother, the father, or anybody who wanted to create a song for the person. You can create a song to, to, to kind of praise somebody but you can also create a song to insult somebody who is misbehaving uh, according to the society in which the person uh, lives. So this is not uh, only in Songhai Zarma. Um, in Senegal also, I know that there are a lot of praise songs for everybody uh, 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 in that instance. Here you see that uh, it says, you're the brew of Lolo. Lolo is poison. And uh, since we're going to talk about hunters, for instance, uh, in ancient Mali, lolo is, um, is the poison that hunters will put on their, on their arrow, for instance. So 
Anybody who knows the culture, for instance, we know that this is a bad, bad, bad poison. So this is what they're put, uh, using to praise her. It doesn't mean she's bad. It just means that you don't, you don't uh, mess with her. We have also sayings. Uh, this I intentionally left in, in, in Shanghai Zama because I wanted to pronounce it for you. It says, Mary Sue Borsara. I got, I got, I don't know, I got, see, Mary Sue Borsara. Weboro means woman, and Mary means ugliness. Okay? So the saying is just saying that um, even when a woman is ugly, she's still beautiful. It's really her character that will that will ruin her so this is a saying that you know uh people say in that in that society i'm sure in west africa the, the same saying will be in different languages so even when a woman is ugly um it doesn't matter it's really her character uh if we if we um if we go deep in this sayings it can also say a lot of things in that sense, positive or negative, about uh, how a, woman, uh, a woman's look should be. This is a proverb. Say, Dura can see how we got it. Ya do can do go some no. So, Dura can see how we got it. Ya do go some no. Just so that you hear the, the, the tonal voice, uh, because Dharma is spoken in kind of tones. Dura can see how we got it. Ya do go some no. Success that doesn't, doesn't protect from shame is nothing more than a pile of chaff. Um, so I'm not sure chaff, but uh, um, chaff is uh, the, that, that thing that comes out of millet or maize or any cereal when you process it. Uh, that's what I understood here, because that's what it's saying here. Do is chaff. So. Uh, what does this mean? It means that if you have, if you are successful in your society and you don't do anything for your people, it's just chef, okay? Because it's not taking the shame away from the people in society. Why? Because maybe some of them are, 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 are um, living in, in poverty. And even when you're successful, it's really not that important for, to other people because you're not helping. So uh, they are canceling the success by saying that it's just a pile of shaft when you're not helping. So um, beauty and fattening. Uh, um, as far as fattening is concerned, for instance, in the society that I come from, that I know, fattening is not forced, like in certain societies. Uh, I will take the example, I think in Mauritania, they are changing it. Uh, for instance, even uh, young girls could be uh, uh, fatted. Um, when I say fattening here, it really has a different connotation, but that's the word I had. Maybe plump, I would say, because um, people uh, try to just have meat on their bones. And so I translated in fattening because um, uh, that's the word that I had. So the water is cold. I would like to take a bath, but the water is cold. I would like to take a bath, but people are here. Whoever is skinny does not take a bath. As long as there are people around, whoever has a prominent backbone will not take a bath. As long as there are people around, whoever has a coccyx with a tail will not take a bath, as long as people are around. So this song is not sung anywhere. Uh, it's women who sing it when they organize their fattening ceremony or beauty contest because women do their own beauty contest. And it's really within a sort of uh, ritual space that they create for themselves just to enjoy themselves. I will not go uh, you know, far in it because we don't have time. It's a whole long story that I have to tell you. But we're seeing here a, a woman criticizing another woman who is skinny actually. So the woman who is skinny, because whoever is skinny uh, does not take a bath, means that the woman will not take her clothes out because she's skinny when everybody else is kind of plump because uh, they, they succeeded in, 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 in changing their, 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 um, their bodies. Uh, whoever has a coccyx, it means that she's so thin, she's so skinny that she doesn't have any, uh, behind uh, in that sense. 
So this is this is a song song uh, for instance um, uh, during the ceremony of Fatu. For them, it also show uh, beauty or lack of beauty therefore. So the, the, the Zama Sangai in the future, um, it's been uh, a few years now that um, the language, the language is always important for the people, but for a few years now, there is an organization, an association, uh, a big group of people who decided that they're going to create a big organization where um, a space actually, where all Songhai Zama, anybody who thinks that he or she is Songhai Zama can join. And uh, each year they, they meet uh, in, in one of the, uh, uh, the, the countries where Shanghai Zama is spoken. And they celebrate its conferences, um, it's, a, it's a festival, it's everything, just to show, for instance, the importance of Shanghai Zama in, 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 uh, uh, today. So what is important is also that they use social media. So people are speaking from, from the Sudan because there is a, um, uh, a community of Songhai people who went and settled in the Sudan from a long time ago. And people think that they are the ones who have, who speak actually the, uh, the, the, the Songhai uh, that was spoken uh, during uh, uh, Askia Mohammed the Great reign. So um, this is what's going on today. And what they are thinking about, because Niger and Mali are having some problems um, with uh, rebels, they're, they're, they're asking, actually they started asking those countries and pushing those countries to, to, to give uh, the Achi Gabero, that's their name, Gabero means uh, the greatest of the great, that they want their own country, a Songhai Zarma country. So um, let me escape this and uh, uh, and um, and show you if I may. Um. Oh, it's working with you. Okay, so. <laughs> So focus on, on the woman, so being plump. Um, so you see the clothes she's wearing goes to ancient Songhai. And uh, she has a pot. You can see she's not a potter, she's singing by just using uh, the pottery of the Songhai Zama. So, um, so she's saying, please ask for me, ask the, 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 the brothers and the uh, uh, sisters if, um, if I can marry her. So uh, obviously somebody came to marry uh, a woman, and uh, since in those societies you don't just go, uh, me and you, uh, the husband is asking everybody if he or if he can marry the woman. You can stop if you want. Uh, I just wanted to show you um, uh, a piece. I sat in. Oui? Um, you sound very, uh, very faint. Are you speaking into the microphone? Yes, I am. Can everybody else hear Isata well? I can. Yes. Yes, yes I, I can. can. I can. Okay. Let me know when to stop. Okay, I say you can stop anytime. Oh, okay, great. Now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for that very informative uh, uh, presentation.
You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And actually, we're going to go right on into your next presentation, um, yes. uh, Dr. Uh, Sidiku, and uh, yes. you've got the floor. Okay, thank you. So um, this one is a longer presentation, a bit longer, right? Um, I have a lot of notes, but um, if um, I'm taking uh, more time, you, you should let me know. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the epic of Sungata. Um, I know many of you already know the epic of Sungata Keita because you've seen the so-called Lion King and also there are films Keita. Um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, there is a film that came out, please don't ask me who, who, who made it. I think uh, in, in things that I read, I think there is another film about Sunjata Keita. So there are some items that I'm going to talk, some elements that I'm going to talk about. For instance, um, uh, the griot, um, uh, who is the griot? I'm going to talk about um, the, the epic, as I know it, the heroes in the epic, women, the concept of baden and faden, and I'm also going to talk about La Parole and uh, show you a bit of what we were performing and then uh, in the Tateta uh, today. So I will start with, um, I'll start with um, the griot. The griot is the, uh, for instance, the, um, the, the person who recites the epic. Only the griot can recite an epic. So the profession of a griot is inherited from, from father to son. In, in general, he is a historian and a chronicle. He recounts the history of the people and more particu particularly for those whose lineage have impacted the world with noble deeds in the past. The griot is an allied of the ruler. He is his counselor and also his ambassador. When I'm saying that the griot is his ambassador, I mean that, uh, for instance, the griot will be the one who will take, uh, um, for instance, news uh, uh, to other emperors, to other griots, uh, for instance. So um, the griot actually in society, although he does all these things for the king, he is feared. At the same time, he's revered. Um, he can take care of um, uh, uh, people's business sometimes, but also um, he can ruin a reputation or provoke a war. We've seen uh, uh, those in many, uh, in the epic of Hamu Badajo, for instance, we see that the griot is the one who provoked war. And even in Sindata Keita, we see that one of the reasons why Sindata Keita decided to attack um, so Sumaoho Kante was actually because Sumaoho Kante snatched his, uh, his um, griot. Another function of the griot is entertainment. So uh, you have some griot who entertain, but it's not the griot, for instance, the one that I have here that uh, usually entertain uh, uh, people in that sense. You also have griots who recount genealogies. Uh, in, some, in some societies in West Africa, the griot who recounts epic is not the griot who recounts uh, uh, genealogies. Uh, usually families have their own griot who would recount their genealogies for, for, for them, and this may take hours of recounting uh, in that sense. So uh, you have the griot who can, who, who, who can uh, uh, recite epics, you have the griot who can recite genealogies, but you also have griots who are very smart, who can recount epic and also recite genealogies. Um, the griot can also play the mediator or advisor uh, in disputes or a negotiator uh, in the community. So when a griot comes to your house because something happened, you refuse to listen to other people, you will listen to the griot because he would use convincing word. He will use la parole that we will see later. So I, uh, just to open a parenthesis, I'm saying la parole 
because I couldn't find in English the word that I'm looking for. Maybe later on somebody will give me uh, another word for it. Um, the specialist of the epic is the hero who is attached to the ruler, to a dynasty or to a so-called noble family. Uh, the master griot, for instance, is the most respected in the profession. So the master griot is the one who travels for, first of all, he's trained by his father and then his uncle. And then if there is a non griot in the place, he will move to, and remember, I'm saying he, 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 uh, maybe later on I will come back to it. And then he will move to other griots. He will travel a uh, space very far to go and continue learning about uh, his, 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 uh, his profession. Um, sometimes it will take more than 30 years. In my, in my research, a lot of griots would tell me that it would take more than 30 years, for instance, to master some epics in that instance. And epics are not just uh, some few uh, songs here and there. There are long uh, narratives that people uh, really uh, tell, sometimes in hours, sometimes uh, in days. So not anybody can become a griot um, uh, in, in, in that society because I said it above, the in people inherit it. Uh, so the griot comes from a group uh, in, in, in West Africa, Songhai Zama, Monday societies, the Soninke. Uh, you have a, a group of people, uh, um, researchers and scholars call them a caste. From where I come from and in Mali uh, during my research, they are not a caste, they are really a group of workers. Uh, uh, who, 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 who do their work uh, and they do different work. For instance, the blacksmith is a blacksmith in those societies and he stays a blacksmith and he continues the, the profession of blacksmith until, for instance, uh, he dies or he's old, he cannot do, do it. Then his son uh, will continue the profession. With the blacksmiths, um, uh, I mean, it's the same thing with the griot. It's the same thing with the woodworker. In those societies, there are people specifically who would work on wood. I cannot go there because that's not my profession. And I would know better, for instance, to not become a griot, a woodworker, a weaver, because it's their domain. I will not go into that domain because I know what that domain has when we come, when we, when we reach uh, the Nyamakala, for instance. So anyway, um, there is also the singing griot. The singing griot is basically just a, 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 a banality in that society. It's, it's a griot who uh, maybe he comes from uh, a family of griot who never succeeded in the society but he, he keeps the, 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 the work, the job of a griot. So he would go to um, naming ceremonies, marriages, because the master griot will never go to a naming ceremony or a marriage unless it is the king's, uh, uh, in the king's lineage. So the singing griot is just the, 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 the simple griot who goes around harassing people. And most of the time, those who don't know these societies will think that these are the griots and, and they keep pestering people. So there are many different levels of griot uh, in that sense. I can say a lot about the griot, but I will just uh, stop there. So they recite epic uh, in, in that sense. Um, talking about the epic, for instance, in West Africa, uh, because there are different languages. Uh, so here, sorry, I have pictures of griot here. You see here? These are three griots. They are all playing the ngoni, okay? The ngoni in Bambaha, but in Songhai Zama, it's the molo. It's a three-string uh, instrument that they're playing here uh, in that sense. So maybe they're all master griots, or maybe the master griot is here, because in Africa also, the clothes people are wearing, you know, tells the status and also difference. Because this is, this, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm not, I will not be surprised. Maybe he's the master griot, and these ones are helping him play. So in some societies, the master griot never plays the instrument. He, uh, 
uh, he has people who will play the music for him. Why do they play music while, while they're narrating the epic? Because uh, it's movement, it's rhythm. And, and uh, from what I was told, the music really guides also the, the, the griot who's telling the story. The griot would know, for instance, um, when the music changes, it's either the music is telling him that now we reach, uh, uh, for instance, a moment when the king is, 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 is doing something, or when the, uh, you would hear when, uh, through the music, when the battle is really going bad, the music will tell you and you will know that something is happening. So the music played by the, the, the music players would tell the griot where he is because sometimes memory, memory fell us, but most of the time they work together. Sometimes, like I said, there are people who will help the griot by playing the music and also by saying, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. It depends on the language. So I'm translating the Songhai Zarma that I know best. That's how the epic is, is, is narrated. Nobody dances, they are sitting and they're narrating. They can sit here and narrate for hours and hours. They might take breaks and then come back for days and days they're narrating the story. These people will help. Sometimes also depending on the society, you will see some women uh, actually uh, just repeating some refrain or just singing, uh, uh, helping uh, the, the, the music players and also the master video in that sense. So moving to the epics, um, there are many terms for the epic throughout, throughout West Africa. Uh, the Bamana people will say mana, okay, or wasala. So before we even had the, the epic, uh, uh, for instance, before, um, uh, 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 they had their own name, uh, for instance, to, to, to refer to the epic. So the Bamana would say Wasala, Mana, the Songhai Zama will say the Deda, for instance, the Fulani, the Fulani will call the epic a Hodu in that sense. And I think somewhere, sometime I read that David Conrad himself, uh, when he did his research, uh, uh, in, uh, 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 he, he said that the epic is called, if I remember, Tariku in Upper Guinea. And also Tariku um, refers to the Arabic word of uh, epic in that sense. Um, so according to John Johnson, uh, epics are poetic narratives of su substantial length on a her heroic theme, and they're multifunctional and multi-generic. African epics also convey very old imagery imaginary sorry structures deeply rooted in ancient um, religion, political, and also social institutions. Epics are told using musical instruments, like I said, and they continue to remain popular and important for populations searching in search of an identity. So even though uh, because of TV, because of the iPhone, because of many other things, people don't have time to sit for the epic, uh, um, they are played on TV. So they were able to, to also live throughout uh, the modern uh, age. They are played on TV. Um, people, people uh, when you go in villages, actually, that's where you will find, uh, uh, for instance, tradition. A lot of people, even though uh, uh, cell phones move to the villages also, some will give time to narrate uh, the epic. Um, the, the musical instrument that are used to narrate an epic are called, for instance, um, or, sorry, sorry man, are, are called, um, are called uh, the koha, the ngoni, or the mono. Um, so I'm, I'm saying some of the, 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 the names that I know uh, in that sense. Um, in some societies, actually, I found out that uh, the griot can also play his own instrument to narrate uh, the story, the epic. But I don't know, is he a master griot or just uh, some griot? Because there are also some griot who will learn uh, some part of an epic and they tell you that this is an epic. With the epic of Sundata Keita, you will find some griot who will narrate something 
and they will tell you that this is the epic of Sunjata Keita, but they will miss a lot of uh, uh, things uh, in that uh, narration. So epics are um, important in the um, important, um, they play important role in the transmission, for instance, of the collective and symbolic heritage. And that is one reason why the epic of Sunjata Keita is the most celebrated epic throughout West Africa. It's actually uh, uh, recited uh, uh, in, many, in many countries. So the heroes in the epic of Sinjata Keita. Actually, who is Sinjata Keita? Um, I will read a little bit um, uh, about um, a summary that I made of Sinjata Keita. He's the son of the Mande King, Nare Maga, and of Sogolon, the Buffalo woman, and uh, who was chosen by the seers to become the seventh star, the seventh conqueror of the world. So already we, we see that he was chosen and he was chosen not by anybody else, but he was chosen by the seers. Um, he is the one who would extend and develop the Mali emperor. Sunjata was born the lion child, but unfortunately for his parents, he had a slow and difficult childhood and ended up crippled. He became the object of mockery in Nyani and was humil humiliated by Sasuma Berete his father's first wife, who wanted the throne for her son, Dankaran Tuma. One day, tired of his mother being persecuted by Sasuma Berete, who is now the queen mother, Sunjata decided to lift himself up with the aid of um, a heavy iron rod and walk to a baobab tree that he uprooted and planted in front of his mother's house. For those who know the epic, the mother went to Sasuma Berete one day to ask her for the baobab leaves and Sasuma Berete uh, took advantage to, to berate her, to insult her, and to humiliate her. That's why Sunjata decided that the Baobab tree will be in front of his mother's house. Once the king Nahi Magan passed away, Dankaran Tuma, who is the half-brother, became king and took away Sunjata's griot, Bala Fasike, that their father gave him. So he took his uh, uh, inheritance and sent Bala Fasike to uh, Sumaho County. So Golan, fearing for the life of, of her son, his sisters and his half-brother Mandi uh, decided to go into exile. After seven years in exile, traveling from kingdom to kingdom with the complicity of his half-sister Nana Kriban and Griyo Bala Fasiki, Sunjata decided to fight his nemesis Sumaroho Kante in order to, take, to retake his old Mali, the creator of one of the old, uh, he was the creator of one of the oldest uh, uh, empire and also uh, he insisted on um, on on um, some laws that I will come back uh, to uh, later on. So that's in Jata Keita and we're, I'm talking about hunters here. Why the hunters? Because the, uh, uh, his, his, his father was a hunter and himself was a hunter and the hunters are very important in, 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 in the victory of Mali in, in that war with Sindeta Keita. We already, already talked about the griot, so I will move to uh, the women. While women play important roles as characters in the oral literature of West Africa in general, they constitute a particularly important motif in the epic. Their portrayal varies according to the different characters or stereotypes they represent. One can find the motif in general, I'm talking about in general uh, uh, African oral literature, we find the motif of the evil stepmother, the mother-in-law, the, the submissive wife, the beautiful sacrificial virgin. Actually, in, in, in another version of the epic of Sunjata, because there are many versions, you will see uh, the mention of the beautiful, beautiful sacrificial virgin or the self-reliant woman in almost all the jars that constitute oral literature. But, the, but in the epic in general, their roles seem to be magnified. Without women, men cannot succeed and the plot of the narrative cannot advance. One of the best known example is of Sogolon, Sogolon Keju here. I stole a, a picture uh, that somebody made. Uh, it's not Sogolon, but just a picture of Sogolon Keju. 
She is the mother of Sundata Keita, and she plays a significant role in raising her child and preparing him to assume eventually the leadership role in his society. But in the epic of Sundata, uh, one also finds seemingly evil women, such as Sasuma Berete, the mother of Sundata's rival, who does everything in her power to preserve power for her own child. Women can be key to success also. We see Nana Triban, uh, the, the half-sister of Sundata Keita. So she's half-sister, and that's, that is important in explaining uh, and understanding the epic also. So uh, uh, she, she, find, she is the one who finds the secret of the power of Sunjata's enemy, uh, Sumaho Kante, because her brother, um, Dankahantuma, sent her to, Sunjata, to Samu, Sa, Sumaho when Sumaho was threatening to, to, to attack uh, Nyani. So um, by going to Sumaho Kaita, of course, uh, she, she, she hears about uh, the poison uh, that, that would be uh, uh, important in killing Sumaho Kante. So she brought that secret to her brother and uh, that enabled uh, Sinjata Keita to, uh, to, to, to save the entire Monday uh, uh, from chaos and domination. So Golom bestows Sinjata his supernatural power and his imperial destiny because of her double Buffalo, so Sogolon is a buffalo and also a spirit. The nine witches also, for those who read the epic of Sunjata Keita, we see that there, yes, there are nine witches, but at the same time, uh, uh, when, 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 when they go to uh, Sogolon's garden to steal uh, from that garden, Sunjata Keita comes and uh, was able to let them steal what they were stealing. So they also help him in, in, in that sense. They help him uh, uh, to become a king. Talking about women, so I will, uh, let's move to uh, the, the concept of the Baden and also the Faden. Uh, the concept of Baden and Faden are important even today in West African societies. Many African societies, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, Senegal, you find the Baden, the Badenya, and also Fadenya. But it's just that they're, uh, you know, they use different languages to refer to these concepts. Um, I'm struggling with uh, um, translating Baden and Faden, which are uh, the, 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 the Bambaha terms, Bamana terms. Um, I, Baden means anything that's around uh, the mother. <clears throat> So one will really uh, miss an important element in the epic without an understanding of these two fundamental concepts of Badenya and Fadenya. Um, Badenya and Fadenya, I think, were translated um, or worked on by uh, Kendall um, uh, and also Bird, two um, scholars on oral literature. But what I would say is that the, 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 the concepts are not unique to the Bamana people of Mali. They appear in the Sunhai Zama language as Nya Ize, Baba Ize. So Nya Ize, Baba Ize. When in, 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 um, in the Mandi world, it's called the Fadenya and also Badenya. So when you say Baden, you're referring to mother, Ba, mother, Fa. Father, when you say Baden, you're referring to everything that's mother. When you say Faden, you're talking about um, the father. So the, the term, for instance, um, bad, Baden, Nespa, or Faden, we find it in, 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 some, in, in Hausa. You say, an -uwa, the, ch the children of the mother. An -uba, the children of the father. So when you say Badenya, you're talking about the children of the mother. Fadenya, the children of the, of the father. Uh, in Wolof, um, maybe Sham can correct, uh, can correct me. In Wolof, for instance, you say uh, Dom in day, in day, the mother, Dom in day. In, in, uh, in Faden, Faden is Dom in bay. Okay? So uh, in their simple definition, Baden is what we could say the concept of mother-childness, 
um, which means the, the, the natural relationship that exists between uterine siblings and father, father childness is the relationship between consanguine siblings. Consanguine, consanguine, consanguine siblings. As such, people recognize a dialectic tension between the individual and the group. This tension is the intersection of two axes. The axis of individuality, referred to as fadenia, which is envy, its jealousy, its competition, its, its self-promotion. Actually, it's everything that pushes the individual to turn his or her back on the community. That's the, the fadenia. And the axis of group affiliation, which is badenya, is, is, is for instance, um, everything associated with qualities that pull the community together. It's stability, collaboration, and selfless, selflessness. That's badenya. In some societies, people will say, for instance, when there is an interior matter, it is solved by the mother childness or the nyaize, the dumbai, I'm, I'm put, mentioning the other uh, terms in different languages. So when there is a, an interior matter, it is solved by mother childness, which is baden. But once the matter is exposed, it is solved by the dumbai, for instance, the faden, the concept of the faden. So basically, what is secret Everything that's between you and I, between the family, everything is the baden. And everything that's public, everybody hears it. And when everybody hears something, you know, problems will start. That's the, 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 the faden in that sense. So you see, uh, you would ask me, what does it have to do with the epic? The badenya, the children of the mother, are all on Sinjata Keita's side. So we see, uh, for instance, uh, um, Nana Kriban, the, the sister, for instance, she is his half sister, but she loves him. So in that sense, it's not because she is his, uh, his, uh, the children of his uh, uh, father that she hates him. She, she, she loves him. She's ready to, to fight for him. We also see Mande Bori, his half brother, who is also his badenya. So he's a man, but he's his uh, Sunjata Keta's badenya because he's ready to, to, to fight on the side of his brother. Whereas, man, uh, whereas Dankaran Tuma, who is the, the king, is Sunjata Keta's uh, faden. He is his fadenya because he's against Sunjata Keta. And because we have a reason, the inheritance. Sasuma, uh, Sasuma Berete, Sunjata Keita's uh, uh, stepmother, is the worst Faden that we could see. So she's in that group of Fadenya who are willing to, uh, for instance, uh, disinherit uh, Sunjata Keita. So I don't know if it makes a sense for you. If we don't see that Fadenya, and, and fad, Fadenya also pushes you away from the group. When you see, for instance, Sinjata Keita going into exile, it's because the Fadenya, which is the, the stepmother, pushes him out. But what is interesting in this concept is that Fadenya pushes Sinjata Keita to go out of the community, to leave the community, to go into exile. But at the same time, he meets some Badenyas on his way, right? He meets these Badenya on his ways, and those Badenya helped him to come back. So we could say it's really a circle for those who are lucky to be saved. We will say that the epic uh, um, uh, is hinting at the fact that uh, uh, because it's his destiny, Fadenya pushed him to, 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 to go out of the community. But because it's his destiny, Fadenya was, all, uh, he, he was able also to come back and create uh, the great uh, Mali Empire. So um, I will talk a little bit about uh, the, 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 the parole. Um, uh, for instance, um, when Bala Faseke um, says, oh, son of Sogolong, I am the word, and you are the deed, 
now your destiny begins. We notice a clear distinction between the griot and the warrior. And we notice a clear distinction between the work of the griot and also the work of the warrior. But we see a complicity already. I already talk, uh, 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 talked to you about uh, Mande Boin being uh, his fadinga. But here also we see the relationship uh, between Bala Fasike and Sunjata Keita. Whoever read the epic will know that they're like brothers together. So uh, for instance, there is a sort of complicity between Sunjata Keita and his griot. And that's what uh, normally and traditionally what, uh, uh, you know, uh, people want to see between a griot and also uh, the ruler. Um, Sundata Keita realizes that uh, um, uh, his, uh, Bala Fasike, his griot, is going to do uh, the promotion of his memory, but not only his memory, but the memory of the, uh, of the, of the, um, uh, of the kingdom. Uh, the griot pushes the warrior to act, and the warrior act to have the griot create the beautiful parole. So that's the importance of the parole here. It's the parole, for instance, Bala, uh, Bala Fasike's parole that pushes Sundiata to gloriously enter history and to enjoy immortality. So that parole is history. And that's why, uh, for instance, Sundiata Keita enjoyed that uh, immortality. So in West Africa, actually, there is a philosophy about la parole. I, I think uh, the word, uh, la, la parole. So it's not only a power of creation, but has a double function of con con conservation and also destruction. Uh, it is the major um, uh, active ingredient of, uh, I think what in English will be called magic. But I mean, when, you, when one say magic, it's really simplified because one sees like, oh, witchcraft and, but here it's their religion. Um, it's, it's really, as all African traditions postulate for a religious vision of the world. So there is this magic. The parole is power because it has magic in it. It's important in the sense that it reveals a, a, a sort of power that uh, comes uh, from uh, nature and also its forces. Um, in the Mandi world, for instance, the parole, the, 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 the the power of the parole, you have it, you use it, because it has the nyama. Um, again, these are words that, uh, that are really a bit difficult to, to, to explain. The nyama in, uh, with the man, uh, in the Mande uh, Empire, with the Bambara, Bamana people, and also even Songhai Zama people, this is the magic, this is something. Uh, the nyama is a powerful, a sort of energy that emanates from nature and all nyamakala. So you hear a nyama, which is, it is the powerful energy that actually everybody has and everybody can work on it to make it really a uh, power. Um, yeah, I see somebody says the power of speech. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, will, I will write it down. Thank you. Uh, so Everybody has the nyama, but we just have to, to find ways to strengthen that nyama that, that we have. So it's a powerful energy that emanates from nature. Um, the chi, yes, the chi. Those who, who read Achebe uh, 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 um, uh, uh, would know uh, the, 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 the chi in, in that sense. So that's the chi. Uh, with the Igbo of Nigeria, uh, I suppose. So, um, and uh, you, can, you can work on it. And uh, the Nyamakala, Nyamakala, the people. Uh, so actually the, 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 the people who work uh, with the wood, with the iron, with fire, they are called Nyamakala, a group of an organization I told you that work with natural uh, elements. And so they are called nyamakala because they are the ones who have the nyama. Uh, they have the nyama, but they have the power. Their nyamas are po more, more powerful than anything that we can think of. So they, 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 because they work it, they use that energy to skillfully carve forms of art. So uh, the, the, the blacksmith, for instance, the hunter, the weaver, for instance, 
uh, when you come from those kind of societies, you know where you stand and they know also where they stand. So the parole here is uh, the art of the Zio. And in Bala Faseke's parole, there is that uh, nyama uh, that appears in many forms in that instance. So we, we see, for instance, Sumao Ho uh, um, uh, has his own nyama. For those who read the epic of Sunjata Keita, you see the, the chambers that Sunjata Keita has. It's all nyama. And, and his yama is the evil yama that he used to destroy, uh, for instance, a uh, community and to destroy himself because there was a time when he could not actually act on his yama. Uh, Sindata Keita, as a child, when he was born, he had, he had the force of the lion and also the force of the, the power of the buffalo. And also we see how the nine uh, uh, witches also who can manipulate uh, 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 people and have their own yama were able to help him in that sense. Uh, uh, so um, actually, uh, you have a text that I have here on, on the screen. I hope that while I was talking, maybe some of you have the uh, uh, you know, opportunity to read it. This, 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 um, this passage, is one of the strongest passage, for instance, when uh, we were children and even today reading uh, the epic of Sindata, the, the, the parole um, uh, here is, is very important. And you could see, for instance, they're using proverbs and proverbs are, are very important in, not only in African literature, but also in mastering the parole. Because uh, the, those who master the parole can come and tell you a story without you understanding anything uh, because, because that's what the belief is. Uh, 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 you may not understand anything because they have the nyama of the power. They have that power uh, uh, you know, that they can use telling you uh, something. Um, Okay, so um, I'll show you, uh, since we talked about the epic and the, uh, uh, the griot, I will show you the epic performance. Uh, let's see. So this is this is the Ngoni, if you can hear me, and the, and this Gio is playing his own instrument. So the music is inspiring him first. So we don't have to listen to the whole thing. Um, I just wanted to give you an example of the Grio narrating uh, a story. Here I see it says Histoire d'un pauvre couple. So um, he's just talking about uh, some stuff. So, um, so moving to um, the epic of Sundata today, I will not say much uh, because I think that uh, Dr. Cham is going to talk a little bit about it, but just so that you know, the Kurun Fuga is the speech that Sinjata had uh, at the end of the war when they defeated Sumaoho Kante. For those who read the, the epic, uh, you, will see, uh, you will see that. Um, and it's the Monday chart, charter, sorry, the Monday charter uh, that was proclaimed in that village. Um, and it's really a powerful chart uh, that um, is becoming more and more famous today uh, because people are interested in, in it. There is a lot of research being done 
and it's a chart, uh, for instance, um, uh, that is one of the oldest constitutions in the world. Um, and it was, of course, mainly in, in the oral form. Uh, it contains a lot of preambles and also chapters advocating social peace in diversity, um, the inviolability uh, of the human being, education, the integrity of the motherland, food security, the abolition of slavery by, uh, by raid, you know, the Arab kind of raid form, and freedom of expression and trade. So it's really uh, very important nowadays. And you will find, for instance, in the Malian constitution, I think some, some parts of this charter. So um, uh, in school nowadays, uh, students all the way to uh, Niger are uh, studying this charter, uh, which was uh, um, in some ways a little bit forgotten because we're also talking about people who like to keep a, 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 a powerful, for instance, um, elements of the uh, African oral tradition secret. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Siddiqui. And this was, you know, I wondered what the challenge was going to be today because we've had technology challenges every day. Yeah. So as I said, sort of at the beginning, she lost access to her computer. So she was speaking to us from the phone while Vanessa was uh, moving her PowerPoint. <laughs> but thank you so much in challenging times for doing this. That was a wonderful presentation. I learned so thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, so our, our next everyone. presenter is um, Dr. Mbai Cham uh, from uh, Howard University. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, Dr. Cham received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, his research interests are oral tradition, modern African literature in English, and French, uh, and also West Africa and South Africa. Africa and the Third World Cinema and Film and African Development. Uh, he has served as the director for the Center for African Studies while he's also been a professor of literature. And guess what? His last day on the job as the center director, our boss, is, uh, <laughs> is, like, is uh, August the 14th or the 15th. So yes, yes. give him a big hand. It's been <laughs> so wonderful for all of us. He brought this wonderful grant uh, the National Resource Center back to Howard University. We so appreciate him. Oh, wow. Now, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Bravo. Well, it's uh, Liberation Day. You know, yeah. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> he but still will be around Brenda. because he's still going to be teaching in, at uh, the Department of African Studies. So, sure, oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. so I'll okay. now turn this over to uh, Dr. Chong. Thank you, Brenda, and thank you, Isetta, for that great presentation there. I'm just going to piggyback on um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what Isetta uh, shared with us in, in, in really very great uh, detail. And um, if uh, you are interested in that last piece that she was talking about, the uh, Kurukang Fugan, mm -hmm. uh, there are these um, uh, two links here that you can go to okay. uh, to get some more information on the details there. Sure. Uh, as, you, as you know, it is actually recognized by UNESCO as part yes. of the intangible cultural heritage of uh, humanity. Because it's a, a and, and there was a big ceremony done back in 2000, well, earlier than that, uh, to really commemorate uh, that particular uh, moment, you know, that is uh, so critical to the history of uh, of, of 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 Monday, and um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, produced, you know, this charter that predates uh, the Magna Carta and all of these other famous uh, uh, sort of declarations of um, human rights. And, and freedoms and uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, this is a, a really foundational original document that again, as uh, Isata has said, um, was forgotten, but now is uh, 
really receiving uh, uh, a lot of revival and being centered now in, 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 in many ways, in many different contexts and societies. All right. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to, uh, let me see, I'm trying to get back to my presentation here today. If I, okay. What I wanted to, to piggyback on um, uh, Isita's uh, presentation, to look at um, the epic of Sunjata, I mean, the way that it resonates in various ways uh, to this day here in contemporary uh, African societies in West Africa in particular, and perhaps uh, also beyond the African uh, continent. And there's been uh, some work uh, done on this uh, particular aspect of the uh, Sunjata epic by uh, various different scholars. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that keep coming out is that you know, uh, the, this emphasis on the fact that the epic is, is, is it's a living document. You know, just like many epics around the world. Uh, if you take epics from all over the world that we're all familiar with, you will see the ways in which in one way or the other, they still have some kind of relevance and resonance to contemporary life. And this is what, uh, in the particular case of uh, the Sunjata epic in West Africa and perhaps a few others, um, <clears throat> are also uh, in that, uh, in that, in that, in that uh, uh, category. But one thing also to emphasize is that um, uh, even though it's a canonical text, it's a very foundational, very important uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> text within Mandi societies, it is by no means fixed, you know, uh, or stable mm -hmm. or unchanging. And it's that flexibility, that openness that is inherent in the text itself that uh, makes it uh, live on, that enables it to uh, to to live on because once it's fixed, once it once it's sort of uh, um, uh, made in concrete, you know, it 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 it, it will die over time. You know, just like anything that you freeze and and, and just put there. I mean, nothing is uh, uh, eternal. I mean, there are things that are eternal, but the way that they become eternal is you know through their openness. You know, to use in different contexts and different. Um, uh, uh, time periods, time spans, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is particularly also the case with the Sunjata epic in that history always in, uh, intervenes to influence and shape the various dimensions of the text, you know. Uh, um, not in terms of reproducing the entire stories, lock, stock, and barrel, but using aspects of the, uh, uh, of the uh, mm -hmm. epic um, uh, in terms of the language, the style, some of the themes, the stories within them, and uh, the performance styles, and so on and so forth, to reproduce them, to make them again uh, within the uh, <clears throat> contemporary context. And uh, one of my colleagues who was at Yale um, uh, came out with a very interesting text uh, back in the 90s, I believe it was Chris Miller, uh, entitled Theories of Africans, in which uh, he devoted part of uh, his study on um, uh, African uh, oral traditions and verbal arts. You know. And uh, <clears throat> one of the statements that he uh, argues and which has been really debated and um, sort of uh, <clears throat> accepted in, in, in many ways by a lot you know, is the fact that uh, versions of the Sunjata epic, uh, I mean, there's this dialectic that is, that is, that is always at play in there, uh, uh, in, 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 in the reproduction of these um, versions of the Sunjata epic. And, and here, the uh, important um, element to emphasize is the plural versions, you know, so there's no one, one, set sort of uh, uh, authoritative or particular uh, version. Mm -hmm. right? um, <clears throat> and, you know, that has to do with uh, the nature of, uh, of, 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 of 
creative texts and, and, and stories in general. But I think uh, uh, the point that he's making here is, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is kind of important and instructive in that, um, as he says here, that these versions are produced dialectically in a conscious symbolic relation to changing political and cultural circumstances. Uh, that is to say that, you know, the epic is always allegorical, always implying, insinuating, in, uh, uh, inciting, and teaching. Right? And it is the allegorical character. Uh, I mean, it's a function of the dynamism, the flexibility and openness of the epic, and indeed of all genres of the oral traditions. And this is one point that I really want to emphasize again, that mm -hmm. um, these uh, stories that you find, whether it's the epic, whether it's the, uh, the dilemma tale, whether it's the trickster story, whether uh, all of these genres in the um, oral traditions, that they are not fixed, you know, they are very flexible. They are, they are, they are, they are, they are very, uh, uh, they are very open. They are not passed down. When you hear people t talking about these yeah. stories mm -hmm. are passed down from generation to generation. They are not passed down in one sort of concrete neat box you know from one generation to the other it, it it things don't happen that way they don't live on that way so it's 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 the flexibility the openness dynamism in the elements that people will always uh, mobilize in their particular context uh to uh relieve uh, to reproduce them and make them uh, uh make them uh continue to live so that you know, uh, Chris uh, here Miller, um, quoting Ma uh, Masa uh, Jabate here, uh, mm -hmm. Malian novelist, describing the Sunjata as a living epic, syncretically mm -hmm. adapted by Grius to enhance the leader of the moment, and he gives a very telling example here. You know, uh, we did mention, I think, um, uh, make reference to the first president of uh, Mali. Mm -hmm. whose name was Modibo Keita. Yeah. Now, when Modibo Keita was the president of Mali in the 60s, the epic was pressed into service as a material force and a weapon mm -hmm. of mobilization for him as a descendant of Sunjata. Right? And when he was overthrown in 1972 or thereabouts by a military leader whose name was Traore, okay, uh, Musa Traore, and he became president, the performance of the epic by some griots began to shift focus yeah. to the uh, Sunjata's companion in arms, Tiramagan Traore. Right? Mm -hmm. So you see again the importance here of last names, right? That um, Siddiqui was talking about uh, yesterday, that Ijamu, right? Uh, Keita and Traore, and when griots praise you, when they try to um, uh, elevate your, your, your statue and so on and so forth, it is your last name, not your first name. It's your last name that they usually will uh, have recourse to. So connecting Modibo Keta to Sunjata Keta and uh, connecting Musa Traore to Tiramagan Traore gives you an idea of the ways in which, you know, some of these uh, elements of the epic and the heroes, the individuals in the epic that Isata also was talking about, you know, become important in contemporary uh, societies in 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 uh, in in uh, in many <clears throat> uh, in many different ways. Right? Um, in general, so as a living epic, the this, this, uh, Sunjata continues to assert. Um, a very, very important thematic and formal presence in much of contemporary Mande and West African creative practice. You know, you find uh, filmmakers, writers, um, uh, playwrights, um, visual artists, uh, musicians, um, and, and, and uh, I mean, the whole spectrum of, 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 of creative practitioners in Africa in one way or the other, engaging aspects of uh, the Sunjata epic and also other aspects of their um, traditional uh, heritage of creative practice 
to uh, make them come alive, to sort of infuse, you know, the new forms, be they the novel or new mm -hmm. languages that they're using, French or English, or um, uh, other genres, film, and so on and so forth, you know, to use aspects of these traditions to infuse these new modern forms that they are, <clears throat> uh they are they are they they're using and there are many examples of uh uh writers uh playwrights and filmmakers who consciously or unconsciously de redeploy elements of the sunjata legend and text and here i pro uh, provide a couple of examples here there are many that we can uh, we can cite and um one of the uh earliest um uh, some of the earliest ones in, uh, would include, you know, the uh, display by <laughs> Laurent Gbagbo. Some of you may know him um, <laughs> as the former president of uh, Cote d'Ivoire, who is now in the clutches of the uh, yeah. International Court of Justice. Uh, well, I think he's been freed. But anyway, you know, uh, I don't think many people know him as, uh, as a writer. But in 79, he did uh, <clears throat> do this adaptation of uh, the Sunjata epic into this play entitled Sunjata Le Lion du Mandeng. And uh, also um, this other play by uh, Jabate, uh, The Eagle and the Sparrowhawk, mm -hmm. uh, L'Aigle et um, Le Pervier mm -hmm. ou Le Geste de Sunjata, or the Sunjata uh, Jest or epic there. Right? Uh, you also have, you know, these other examples here uh, the Tana de Sumanguru here again, looking at uh, the um, uh, main opponent of uh, Sunyata in the in the in the story there, Sumanguru, and um, uh, many many other uh, others that again are listed here. If you're interested, you might be able to go into them uh, a little. Perhaps the more well known, as I sort of started out saying would be uh, Keita, Heritage of the Grio by Danny Kuyate mm -hmm. that some of you mm -hmm. probably know and have already started using or have used in your, uh, in your classes. Now, this is, uh, in, uh, it's interesting to note uh, again, that when uh, a person like uh, Danny Kuyate, you know, uh, a filmmaker from Burkina Faso, um, <clears throat> uh, takes up the subject of, of, of Sunjata, and he also does it in another film entitled Sia, Le Rêve du Python, Sia, the, the, the Dream of the Python, which uh, uh, is, is, is so, some kind of a, um, an engagement with the myth of Wagadu, you know, uh, in the empire of Ghana that David Conrad and others had referred to earlier, you know. But when Danny Kuyate decides to engage this canonical story, of uh, of 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 uh, of, of uh, uh, Sunjata, he doesn't try to retell the story from beginning to end. You know, I mean, in the epic, as Isata was saying, you have this three-part structure. You know, birth, exile, and return. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, uh, Danny Kuyate's film, it's not an attempt to retell the entire story from beginning to end. I mean, it's impossible to do that in film anyway, you know. Um, uh, so what he does is really to uh, look at uh, an aspect of uh, the narrative up to the time when Sudhyata is about to go to exile, you know. And from that point on, it's the young person, Mabo, that this young, uh, old Griot comes to initiate in his tradition, who takes up the story, you know, to tell to his classmates. So, you know, there's uh, a lot that is packed in that film there, using the epic to engage, you know, uh, to retell not only the story of this great emperor, Sunjata, right? Um, but it's also um, a film that uh, Danny Kuyate uses to engage, you know, some of the burning issues in contemporary society today in Burkina Faso. Issues around tradition and modernity. Uh, all of these are really very, very front and center in, in, in many aspects of the film. 
and more importantly also questioning the sort of traces, the uh, residues, the residual traces of uh, um, the legacies of colonial education that mm -hmm. are still very much present in much of uh, the educational systems that you find in Burkina Faso and also in parts of Africa, where, for example, the Grio who comes to initiate Mabo to uh, the um, uh, to, to, to the story of uh, Sundia Taketa, which is not taught in the schools. Again, this is uh, uh, mm. part of that uh, issue of, you know, uh, culturally relevant education. I mean, what do you teach these schools? You know, do you keep teaching them that our ancestors were the Gauls, you know, nos ancêtres les Gaulois, mm. or, or do you begin to really um, make a space for, you know, the kinds of, uh, uh, stories that you know uh, are constitutive of their own heritage, of their own histories, and uh, so on and so forth. So in the film, you see this confrontation, this dialogue between the griot and the teacher, you know, in 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 the modern school, and you know this uh, sort of juxtaposition, this putting side by side of these uh, two systems of education, and 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 provoking some kind of a debate discussion as to how do you uh, come to terms with, uh, uh, with, 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 with these uh, contradictions that are <clears throat> uh, inherent still today in, uh, in, uh, in these systems here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you see in, in, in Danny Kuyata's film, a very important engagement of uh, this ancient text, you know, which looks at it, engages it in a very, very, uh, different, uh, uh, different fashion. Right. <clears throat> um, Sundiata beyond Africa again. Um, uh, we, I certainly did refer to Disney's The Lion King, um, that created a lot of debate. You know, um, did the creators of The Lion King um, uh, know exactly, you know, the origin of that story, or was it, uh, mm -hmm. as they said, you know? Um, uh, taken from Hamlet, or <laughs> was it actually the story of Sunjata, and so on and so forth. But again, that's a debate that, you know, uh, took place and perhaps it's still raging on, has uh, uh, many different implications there. But again, the idea uh, uh, is, is, is that, you know, elements of this uh, African epic, you know, has traveled uh, in one way or, an or another. Okay, consciously or unconsciously, into the creative space and and and, and uh, minds of uh, folks, you know, beyond uh, beyond uh, the continent. And I guess the latest iteration of that, in some way, and again, it's not a very one-to-one -one correspondent type of uh, um, engagement, but you know, more sort of an inspirational uh, um, uh, approach, you know. Uh, the latest iteration of that is Beyonce's um, uh, Black is King, which just premiered um, last week, I believe. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. sure how many of you have had the opportunity to uh, uh, see that yet. But again, um, yeah, these are, these are just some thoughts that I wanted to uh, share in relation to, you know, how this epic uh, lives and, 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 and takes on different, um, uh, different forms, different uh, different life, so to speak, you know, in different spaces, uh, uh, in different genres, and 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 so on and so forth. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chom. Uh, at uh, this point, we are going to transition to the Q and A. Uh, handled by uh, Dr. Bond. So if you have a question, uh, put it in the chat box and uh, she will moderate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siddiqui and Dr. Chom. Uh, we have some very interesting questions. I'll start back with Dr. Siddiqui's uh, uh, presentation first. Uh, what are some of the practices of ancestral cults? Do Islamic leaders condone, challenge, ignore, or support these ideas? <clears throat> Thank you for the question. 
Of course, no, they condone these ideas because just like the French colonialist who came, <coughs> excuse me, who came in those societies said that those are not uh, religions that people are just believing in stupid pagan stuff. Yes, the Islamic uh, community also, they, they do their best to discourage people to believe in those things. But the, the hypocrisy is that even those Islamic, you know, uh, 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 priests, for instance, sometimes when they pray to, to, to Allah and things don't work, they go back to, 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 to the traditional, well, I don't like traditional priests. They go back to the African priest. So um, it's, really, it's really something, um, uh, I don't know, it's hypocrisy. Because Islamic uh, priests want power, they want to dominate, and they want to make um, uh, people think that everything that they believe uh, from the ancestors are not really something important. Yes, so there is, there is tension. But people superficially, uh, you know, would agree, but uh, no, uh, secretly, because also a lot of the, uh, the religious cults that we know talk about secret, secret, but secretly people would go back to their uh, ancestral uh, religions. Thank you for that. Uh, next question, does Songhai Zerma have a common language branch or any, con uh, any connection to Mende or Bantu language groups? Bantu languages, I, I don't know, but with the Mende, there are a lot of words in Zerma, when you speak Zerma Songhai, that also appear. For instance, I was talking about Fadinya, Badinya, um, uh, the Nya, Nya, that's uh, the radical mother, appears also in, in, in Monday. And uh, I can't think of any word now, but there are a lot of words. Nyama, for instance, Nyama, Nyamakala. The Songhai Zarma say Nyamakala, the Nyamakala, those uh, mm -hmm. uh, social uh, uh, workers, group workers, the Nyamakala. Um, so yes, there are some words and people really uh, um, sometimes say maybe the Songhai Zarma came from the Bamana people, but I think that one of the reasons why there are many words in common and uh, the, the languages are a little bit related is the fact that most of, most of us, all, you know, of those ancient empires came from Wagadu, the empire of Ghana. Which, which, which spoke the Soninke, because maybe the root is Soninke for the Zarma Songhai, for the Bamana, for the Malinke, maybe the root is uh, Soninke, because I know that um, uh, in, in the countries we're talking about, the secret language is Soninke. When you go to a seer, if you want to know about something about your future, uh, those who are really vested in it, in the ancient languages, they still speak Sonanchi, and we say it's the secret language. So maybe because people, uh, they, those pe the people we're talking about originally came from uh, uh, Wagadu, maybe that's one of the reasons why you find some language connections. Thank you. Um, and also, um, yes, I, I, yeah, I think. Uh, the, um, at the at the sort of the lexical level, mm -hmm. sort of the words, you know, you mm -hmm. have a lot of borrowings and yes. um, uh, words that you know may have, uh, particularly in those areas that are Islamized, yes. sort of, you know, that uh, where mm -hmm. Arabic is also um, quite prevalent. You do have uh, words from Arabic that are sort of inflected. Uh, mm -hmm. in the local languages. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, I said that you did give one example of mm -hmm. Suba in, mm -hmm. in, in, yes. in, in Songhai, yes. which is the same word that we use in Wolof like, yeah. for, yes. for, for yes. morning. Mm -hmm. And in Swahili, I think it's mm -hmm. uh, Subuhi or, uh, okay. so so you have those uh, similarities mm -hmm. on, uh, on, on that level there. But I think mm -hmm. the question was more of, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, um, I mean, it was deeper than that in terms of, you know, the language mm -hmm. groups and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah polar as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We have an interesting comment, and, and thanks for Dr. Chom to, to jump in on that, as well as Dr. Siddiqui. Someone mentions about the connections between Hindi and uh, in terms of, you just mentioned Suba, and Hindi means the morning, and 
hmm. the questioner is asking, what are the connections between Songhai, Zerma, and Hindi? Yeah. Um, that's so interesting. Yeah. Sometimes language also follows migration. Uh, yeah. Comment? I know, I know also, I know also, that, uh, I, I have um, a friend of mine from India. She's from Kerala. And uh, one, uh, she cooked food and uh, we were about to eat when I was a student. And she's like, oh, let me get some, some ghee. And then she went and took, you know, some oil, you know, that like, uh, um, the so well, I put right. it quotation, uh, natural cow butter, and I'm like, what do you call it again? She said ghee. I said we call it ghee as well. So oh, really, it's re yes, Caroline. yes, mm -hmm. it's ghee. They call it. We call it ghee. So I have <laughs> no idea. I don't know the ghee. I find it interesting. And now that we're talking about suba, that maybe suba is connected to. To the Arab world, Arabic, uh, yeah, it's Arabic. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's really yeah. funny because I don't, I don't know if ghee is connected to the Arabic world. So maybe the, uh, you know, uh, the Arabs went to Asia. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't. Maybe Dr. Cham has something to say. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, again, that. Uh, well, you know, I mean, there was this, the historically there's been that. Um, uh, the Indian Ocean route also, mm -hmm. when, when you talk about uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. the um, the trade in human beings, so. Uh, yeah, and also, and also we know that um, even though uh, Western uh, history and everything tell us that Africans never traveled, we know that uh, during those empires, they did travel to Asia, to Europe and all over. So maybe it's con the language is connected to that. I really don't, I don't know. And I don't want to say maybe, but I find it really uh, you know, interesting. The question was really interesting. And now you're pushing me to do uh, some research um, <laughs> and see what I can find. Thank you for the question. Yes, just uh, going to our later questions here. But uh, is Songhai a kind of universal language for the region? If Shanghai is what? It's kind of a universal language for the, re the region, the questioner is asking. Yes, actually, that's, that's one of the reasons why I was talking about Achi Gabeho, because um, people nowadays uh, are really thinking that millions of people speak the language. And that's one of the reasons why they, they want to, to, I mean, the idea is still in, uh, in, in, into its infancy, but they're really thinking of creating their own kind of geographical space for the Songhai people in that sense. And it's, it, it really, it's not only Mali, Niger, before people thought that it's Mali and Niger, but it's really Mali, Niger, Ghana, Nigeria, Sudan, a lot of countries in West Africa. So they want to universalize it. We see what, what would be done uh, in that sense. Thank you. Moving on to the part of your presentation where you were talking about the West African epic, we have a question. Uh, the West African it, what? Epic. Epic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, they're asking, so is it more like a guild of sorts instead of a caste, more religious based? It's not just, it's not a religious space, uh, maybe a guild, because when uh, I am the one who, who have a problem with caste, because when, you talk, when we talk about caste, we think India, because in my teachings, for instance, I see a lot of, you know, students who will go like, oh, the Indian caste, I'm like, no, it's different. Um, the, the, society, the West African societies, and even today, a lot of them function like that. You have people who are farmers. You have people who are herders. I cannot be a herder. You have people who are herders. You have people who work with, with fire, iron. That's the blacksmiths. You have people who are called so-called noble, royalty. It, it doesn't mean that they, they don't work. They farm, they, they, they are, for instance, traders and everything, but they don't go into uh, becoming the blacksmith. The, the guild that we're talking about, the blacksmith, 
the weavers, the woodworkers, the hunters, the, 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 the griot, and even griot um, uh, is a word that comes from Portuguese. So <laughs> I don't like to use griot because that's not what they call themselves. I call them whenever I am in their uh, um, vicinity, location, geographical location, I use the term that they call themselves. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, these are people, uh, okay, let me just go back. People think that the griot, for instance, uh, or of lower status, lower status. But there are a lot of them who are not on that so-called lower status. That's the mistake that people make in the sense that the societies we're talking about, they're really hard to define just like, yeah, it's just a group of workers. No, they have roles in the societies that, um, that are a bit difficult to define and i'm trying i'm struggling to to see what kind of name i can give uh, the people it's uh, divided into into uh, those who do this those who do that and you don't cross and go but of course nowadays because of modern times uh you can marry a, a, a somebody of your origin you can marry somebody of a blacksmith origin your parents, even today, would not let that happen. But because you decide, you choose to marry who you want, they will say, okay, good, you will see what you will see, just the way they use it. Thank so, you, Dr. Uh, Siddiqui. I, yeah. I don't want to interrupt, but uh, we're to start a break at 1045. And I wanted to get to at least a question on Dr. Tom's presentation. So I apologize for that interruption yes. there. No, I'm sorry, you're right. It's no, no, okay. no, that's okay. A uh, couple questions combined. Uh, can women serve as griots, and are there efforts to support contemporary <coughs> griots? How are oral tradition stories being incorporated uh, in scholarship research that is primarily based on written sources? Dr. Chong. Okay. Um, uh, can Can you repeat the second part of the question? Yeah, the the first the, one was about women griots. Women griots. Yeah, I got it. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the second one is, are there efforts to support contemporary griots? How are oral traditional stories being incorporated in scholarship research based on- Oh, okay. All mm -hmm. right. Well, um, again, because of uh, sort of the gender dynamics, you know, uh, uh, roles and so on and so forth that you find in uh, many societies traditionally so, sort of, you know, I mean, there are still traces that are still manifest today. Um, <clears throat> women, uh, you find women who are even more accomplished in the art of the griot, <laughs> let's see, I mean, in, in Wolof we use the term gewel, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. who can, who can, uh, who know the history, who know all of those, uh, elements that go into the making of a master griot as uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. was, 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 uh, was was saying you know who master all of those skills there very very proficiently mm -hmm. but because of the uh, sort of masculinist orientations of many of these societies they are not allowed to uh, they, they are not prominent you know as, as, as front performers you know mm -hmm. you'll see them accompanying their husband um, and, and, and uh, playing in the background. Uh, in a few cases, you know, where there are ceremonies, you know, that are mostly dominated by women, you will see them there, you know, where the yeah. male presence is not that much, you know, you will see them there. And that's where you really begin to get an appreciation of the kind of talents and skills that they have, which are equal and sometimes even more than those possessed by the male griot. So yes, there's gender bias that is at play there. But yes, um, there are female griots, very accomplished, you know. And uh, on the first day, I did post this link to this uh, young woman from uh, the Gambia, Sona Jobate, who is really one of the maestros or maestros, I don't know which word is <laughs> uh, appropriate here, of the Kora. You know, usually women are not associated with the Kora, but I mean, if you get a chance to really um, uh, look at, uh, you know, some of her performances, 
it is absolutely, absolutely amazing, wonderful, the way that she has mastered that Kora. Even, I mean, she's from that Jabate uh, family um, of, of Tumani Jabate, the clip that I think, uh, uh, was it um, Lesina who showed it or somebody else? But anyway, uh, yes, the short answer is yes, you do find these um, female yeah. griots, you know, just like you find women writers, you know, who uh, at one point, you know, were producing, but their works were not being published. But then, you know, once mm -hmm. that wave of um, worldwide um, uh, feminism began to change the landscape a little bit, you know, uh, their works just exploded. And right now, today, uh, one can say pretty much that, you know, uh, like in African-American letters, um, African literature is, I mean, the most exciting work is really coming out of women writers, you know. Uh, film mm -hmm. is a little bit different, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the other question about uh, supporting contemporary griots, it's interesting now, um, <clears throat> because griots now, uh, many of their uh, kids um, are now uh, educated, you know. Um, they have now, you know, began to really establish um, uh, their own sort of businesses, so to speak, you know. Uh, instead of um, uh, the, the, the old paradigm where researchers would fly in, interview them, record them, and fly out, you know. Now you see these happening internally, locally. And I think uh, perhaps Jean in her presentation might be able to shed some more light on, 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 some, of these, uh, on some of these dynamics. You know. But yes, there are some um, countries in West Africa, I know of um, Gambia, Senegal, in Burkina Faso, where they are really focusing more and more on the cultural industries and a significant part of uh, that cultural economy is um, the work of these uh, traditional um, performers, you know. Um, and there are different structures in place here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I'm bumping up against the break, but I did just wanna leave with this one question that people were sort of mentioning and that's a connection between the griots and today's or yesterday's minstrels. So I'll mm -hmm. end with that and pass it over to uh, uh, Brenda Randolph. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, both of you, for those fine presentations. And we will now take a break and come back uh, at 11, and we, we will hear our last presenter, uh, Dr. Tungara. Take a break. All right. Thank you, Brenda. I have to go to a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Here's <laughs> and just recently retired. Uh, Dr. Tungara taught courses on contemporary Africa, the African diaspora, and women in Africa. Her research focuses on Cote d'Ivoire and Francophone Africa. She earned a BA, MA, and PhD degrees in African Studies and, the, and History at the University of California at Los Angeles. Dr. Tungara. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Brenda uh, and Vanessa, let me thank you so very much for putting this together and for inviting me to speak. Um, I want to also thank uh, Aisata and um, Mbai for laying the groundwork for some of the things that I'll have to say in this presentation. Uh, my presentation uh, will attempt to provide for our teachers um, some of the background as to you know, why are we here? Why are we here now? Why are we here now looking at these particular issues and perhaps to give them some tools for ways that they can uh, manage the, the data, the, the oral ethics, the uh, oral traditions and such after they leave um, the, the seminar. So that uh, is the approach that, that I've taken. So in the course of doing that, um, I've organized my thoughts around five questions. Number one, why do African voices matter? Number two, are oral texts reliable? 
num and some of the issues in dealing with oral texts. Number three, what are the sources of oral histories and who are its keepers? Number four, what can we learn? What is endogenous knowledge? What can we use going forward? How are our uh, people in these countries and societies attempting to engage endogenous knowledge? And finally, how do African voices actually speak to us? You know, when we read uh, those texts, and here we'll just work off of one of the examples that I collected in the field. Um, you know, what, what are we hearing? What are they telling us? What are we learning about the society as we attempt to engage with this beautiful poetry, uh, the songs, the, the lyrics? In my own work, I went after song lyrics because they are public presentations. And so in addition to what uh, children learn at home next to their mothers about how to live in society, I wanted to understand the ideological underpinnings of a culture. And one of the ways to do that was to hear the public presentations and what they were saying to one another, what they valued about themselves that came across through the song lyrics. So that's, um, those are, these are the five questions that uh, it looks like six actually on this, but uh, these are the questions that I will engage uh, in this presentation. Uh, the photo on, on the right there is uh, one that I took in Northwestern Côte d'Ivoire, Mandiana. It's an area that very few people know about, but there will be a few. Uh, my, my research is in the far northwestern region of Côte d'Ivoire. That's where I collected most of my uh, oral research right there on the border between uh, Guinea, Mali, and Cote d'Ivoire. So, you know, that, those communities are part of what you might call a Manding diaspora. Uh, as people left the, um, that center, central area, you know, of the, from the origins of, of Ghana, ancient Ghana, Wadadu, you know, into Mali, into that huge empire of Songhai. And so as you have these words of expansion, people continue to migrate outward. And so this particular community, you might even call it a frontier state, uh, this particular community is, is part of that long tradition of uh, Mande migrations that, that carried Mande peoples and Mande cultures and, and languages, you know, spiraling out from that center area into these broader spaces of the Western Sahel. Okay, so first, why do African voices matter? So I have a few bullet points here, but I'll, I'll go along with my text. Um, so even uh, for our teachers, even in your own studies, you know, I'm sure that you are told many, many times that anything to be believed had to be written down. And so that was the way in which African uh, history was approached. If it wasn't written, then it didn't exist. Okay, so um, in 1982, Eric Wolf wrote a book called uh, Europe and the People Without History. And so in this, he, he describes the marginalization uh, of the fringes of humanity, of, of peoples who literally succumb to European imperialism. So in other words, you know, they underwent this type of erasure. Um, another uh, thing that affected the ability to understand these far-reaching cultures outside of Western Europe had to do, of course, uh, with the Enlightenment period. Because a lot of what we study today uh, emerged as a result of the Enlightenment period. This is where you have the Enlightenment scholars, um, in the 1830s and such, who started writing everything down. They were focused on categorizing and ranking the peoples and cultures that they had encountered and conquered. So this resulted in the creation of something called races within the unique human race of Homo sapiens sapiens. So the creation of these so-called races had to do with um, physical characteristics, and for the people who were writing the history, Western Europeans, they had to be at the top. 
and those who did not look like them were ranked leading to the bottom where you find Africans. Even Thomas Jefferson writing in his period said that black people were one step away from the orangutan. So that's how vicious and severe the efforts to erase black people as part of the human race. Um, that's how vicious and severe these efforts were. Okay, and once again, even if you look at some of the old maps, you'll find Germany at the center of the world. Why a small place like Germany is at the center of the world? It's there because the cartographers were German. And of course they put their own country at the center and diminish the sizes of all of the other uh, areas of the world. Okay, for those of you who teach anything about world history, I hope you're using the, the Peters Projection World Map because it shows a truer idea of the sizes, the, the, the actual size of the continents as they exist on the face of the earth. Because we need to give our children a better idea of exactly where people live and the, the area of territory within which these people live. So the Peters projection maps are, are, would be a, an excellent addition to anything that you're teaching with regard to world history or Africa or anything else for that matter. Um, okay, so we come to the point where we begin to understand the decades of erasure of African history and culture that occurred during colonial rule. We see that the representations and images related to Africans during the transatlantic slave trade are negative. So you, you know, you have people that suffer, you know, this, this transport you know, across the ocean. And so the representations of them as they descend from those ships, okay, are horrible negative presentations. But those are the presentations and representations of people that um, is communicating, written down, okay? And, and because of the severity of their conditions and the fact that they were a subjugated people, then this also uh, uh, leads to these perceptions of black people in the wider world. Okay, another thing the lack of written sources by Africans themselves. Okay, so what do we have that's written in these early periods about Africans? It's mostly coming from the Arabs. Of course, these Arab Muslim um, travelers had their own ideas about Africans who weren't Muslim because Muslims were superior to everybody else. Okay, so even those early, early writings are rife, okay, with negative perceptions of Africans. Okay, now further, you finally have, you know, once the, the Europeans figure out how to get around the hump of Africa and to penetrate the African interior, you have European explorers coming with them. And they were often funded by groups that were interested in the economic exploitation of the continent. Okay, some of them were, were missionaries wanting to uh, expand Christianity into the quote unquote darkness of Africa because Africans weren't Christian, even though there were some Christians uh, in Central Africa from a very early period. That's another story separate from our Gold Road program. So rarely did you have colonial officers who were willing to engage and begin to record the local histories of the people that they were commanding. So you have these colonial officers, the commandant, you know, and so you have a very few of them who were willing, like Maurice de la Fosse, for example, willing to actually write down some of these uh, traditions, histories, as the Africans in those areas where he, to which he was assigned were able to actually tell him. Okay, so overall, what we have then is a prol proliferation of these very exotic printed stories about Africans in Europe you know, about Africans presented to European audiences, all right? And unfortunately, these things carried over. So people embrace these prejudices, you know, against Africa. So when we talk about why do African voices matter, we're, we're 
talking about a revolution. We're talking about an opportunity for Africans to reclaim their own histories. And notice that I'm using the, using the plural, to reclaim their own histories. Okay, and it's very important that we, as people who attempt to deliver information about Africa, that we understand how diverse the continent is. I mean, the continent is huge. You know, you've got nearly 800 different ethnic groups, um, you know, grouped into a certain number of, of languages and, and, and such. Okay, so the question is, how do we, how do we then, I think I jumped too far in my presentation. I need to go back a slide and I have to figure out how to do that. All right, so the question then is, you know, how do, what, what's expected uh, at this point? All right, so I have here, um, this, this, this work created, you know, a, a huge splash, you know, when it was produced in 1998, when Vincent Mudembe, in his work called The Invention of Africa, African Gnosis, uh, when he started talking about the representations of Africa, all right, the representations of Africa. Where do these things come from? So his work, uh, The Invention of Africa, Nyasa's Philosophy, and the Order of Knowledge. The Order of Knowledge. There's a, a French scholar at the time by the name of Foucault who started working on, who was working on something called the archaeology of knowledge. I mean, we as, as, as learners, you know, when we're introduced to a field, we want to take everything that's written, we want to memorize it, and so that's the last word written, I understand this, this is it. Okay, well, these scholars started teaching us how to dig deeper, not to take the written word at face value, but to understand that words emerged from a context in an earlier period. And so these words are, are like icons. They, they, they're loaded with meaning. They're loaded with relationships. Okay, and frequently relationships of hierarchy. So Mudembe um, investigates the power of anthropologists, missionaries, and ideologists to project images of Africa while diminishing the value of African thought in favor of Western models and theories. So he questions the extent to which their perspectives modify the fact of a silent dependence on, an, on a Western epistemy. Okay, think about it. How many of us, we all have our lenses. You know, we all grew up in, in this society. So one of the first steps that we have to do as we begin to engage these fields is to interrogate ourselves and somehow find the humility to know that we don't know everything, <laughs> okay? And, and to consider that there might be other lenses to which these things that we might call facts Okay, other lenses, you know, for interpretation. Okay, so, you know, as I said, the African continent is huge. And we want to be aware of that. We want to avoid generalizing, because what you're learning here in the Western Sahel is not the same thing that you're going to learn when you do these same kinds of studies in Southern Africa or Eastern Africa. Okay, you have a huge, huge... Bantu family in, in Central Africa that spreads into Eastern Africa along one line of migration and, you know, down Western Africa into Southern Africa another, through another line of migration. But we have to engage each one of these areas. Okay, and learn about them. You can't take the Sinjata epic, for instance, and go to Southern Africa and think everybody knows about it. The only people that might know about it might be uh, young people who may have studied it in school as part of their West African history class. Okay, so we want to um, understand that the continent is vast. And so in the language that we use to represent the continent, we always have to have that little caveat. We have to say, well, in this particular area or among these particular people, this is what is studied. Or this is how what these particular people do. 
Um, now, in the area that I work on, northwestern Cote d'Ivoire, when I was down there, you see some of these people here uh, in the in the photo to your to your right. You know, when I asked some of them about the epic of Sinjata, they said, "Oh, you know that that's not around here. That's for those people further north." <laughs> okay, so they immediately took some distance from it. All right, so um, we have to understand that uh, you know very much of these are localized. Now, on the other hand, we look at the work of Hampate Ba, H A M. P-A-T-E, last name, Ba, B-A, Ambati Ba, illustrious scholar, philosopher of Africa uh, and West Africa in particular. And he looked at the, what do you call it? The, the ecumen. What's the weather today? Right now in Southern. He looked at what he called the, the ecumen so that the areas that we're looking at do have a lot in common. He was able to, to look at what all these different people had in common and to uh, communicate that Ghana Mali Song, that these areas had uh, a basic common cultural framework. Um, the linguist has always been very good also at, at looking at transformation of language and linguistic groups to help us know who's related to whom. Because as the as the um, uh, structures of languages, uh, you know, relate to particular language families, often then culture will travel with those languages and the people who speak them. All right. So you know, all of this to say that when we're looking at the West African savannas, the Sahel region, the area that we're, is under study here, there are a lot of commonalities of that culture. Okay, now when you go to another region, you will find something different and the practices of those people must also be respected. Okay, um, so with regard to methodology, one of those who made extraordinary contributions to the practice of uh, orality and collecting oral traditions, of course, was Jan Van Sina. Jan Van Sina was a, a Belgian scholar and who since passed on. And he provides a definition of and a methodology for collecting and interpreting oral traditions. Oral traditions capture a distant past. Okay, now we may have eyewitness accounts or rumors, okay, based on some something sensational. You know, like I run and I tell you, oh, you know, this happened. Look at our own society. You know, what happened? Okay, so then the question is, how do these eyewitness accounts become part of a group's oral history in future generations? In future generations. Okay, so he emphasizes how those representations are carried forward from the past. Okay, and some of those, those um, representations could have been produced through dreams, through visions, hallucinations even, okay? And so the forms that we study today, that we look at, um, include prayers, poetry, epics, narratives, you know, found in tales, or proverbs, or even sayings. Look at the way we use the Bible today, going back to Psalms, or, or going back to Ephesians, or going back to to you know, Timothy, these different books from, you know, if you um, study uh, Christianity or the Bible, these different books based on experiences, you know, the stories that come forward and how they teach. Okay, so there are lessons in there that are then brought to future generations. So we're reading uh, the past and the oral histories that emerge from the past, okay? So these accounts, according to Vancina, are what he calls the historical consciousness of present and past generations. So the way we use them, you know, Vancina advise, advises caution. You can't just read a narrative and say, oh, this is true. And in my own experience in collecting oral histories in Northwestern Cote d'Ivoire, what was very clear is that in the presentation of the narrative, 
the performers are speaking in their contemporary time. So it's not unusual for you'll see something contemporary or recent creep into the song that they're singing or the story that they're telling. Because what is the goal ultimately? It's to communicate with an audience. So if you write it down at that moment in time, then you know we owe it to future generations to put an asterisk and say, at this time in this particular culture, these are the things that were happening. So that we understand why something that appears to be anachronistic appears in something that we're reading. Okay, so as you pick up, you know, we've made all kinds of recommendations in your bibliography for different um, epics and narratives and oral histories that you'll have to read. Okay, so we want you to relax, to enjoy them um, for the songs and praise poetry and such, to even recite it out loud, you know, to, to get into the movement, to have your students, you know, to recite these things out loud. Uh, and at the same time, attempt to hear how these performers were trying to communicate with an audience that may have been in front of them at that particular moment. Okay, so what is the story? So after we collect these oral traditions, then the researcher must proceed to an analysis of the message and its meaning to the societies within which they are told. So we're talking about a type of social present. So the memories are part of a pool of inherited culture. Okay, part of a pool of inherited culture. All right, so that we are learning how from this pool of inherited culture, mores and values are translated and go forward from generation to generation. So you can see how these oral accounts sort of create a foundation for each generation. Okay, through which people are able to identify their place. Okay, and, and the, the values and mores that their culture, that their communities hold uh, in great value. Okay, and you're going to see that uh, in the um, oral praise poetries and such that you read. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Okay, so what are the sources of these oral history? Who tells these stories and who are the keepers of these oral traditions? Okay, well, you know, um, Isatu and, and, and Bai uh, were able to provide some background information, so I don't have to spend as much time on this, but I do want to be very clear through this slide uh, about the representation of Mande society. Um, the so called horo. Now, I have used the singular here in each one of these. Um, in the Mande language, if you put a W, then that will make it plural. So you have the horo or you have the horong if there were a W there. So what is the horo? The horo is a free born person. Okay, sometimes, you know, in French they're called nobles, les nobles. Okay. Now, these are people, as it was explained to me, uh, who have no, no occupational definition. These are people who farm for themselves. They aren't obliged to work for anybody. Okay, and so the, the horo, uh, thanks to the charter, <laughs> Uh, that you just learned about. The horo were at the top. And there are some scholars that see the battle, Sunjata's battle, you know, as a battle for the superiority of the horo. Okay, because he beats back an emerging uh, blacksmith you know, who wants to govern over the area. All right. So, and his victory is a victory for the horn, a victory for freeborn persons, okay, who continue to exert, you know, authority over everybody else. Now, within the horn, of course, you know, you could be a wealthy horn or you could be a poor horn. 
but nonetheless, you're born a Horo. Okay, now, the Horo, the, these freeborn persons, free of these occupational definitions and such, only marry other Horo. Okay, let's take a look at this group called the Nyamakala. You know, a person who is part of a Nyamakala belongs to what we call, you know, one of the endogamous castes, and we'll get to that. Okay, and the idea of an endogamous caste, again, uh, they only marry among one another within their occupational definition. All right, and so this notion of caste has to be understood within this ecumen of West African Sahelian communities. Okay, the third class among the Horo, among the um, Man Mande, Mandinka, and such, or the Malinke, is the Jong. The Jong is an enslaved person. An enslaved person loses authority of any kind over himself or herself. Okay? So once someone becomes a jump, an enslaved person, okay, that person has to follow the instructions of either their Horo master or their Nyamakala master or whoever has acquired him or her. All right, now, I'm just going to jump a little bit ahead because this is a little, you know, piece that some people may want to understand is that as kingdoms expanded, as wars were fought, as people were captured, okay, if people captured someone belonging to one of the endogamous castes, they were enslaved with other people of the same caste. Their skill sets were valuable. And so the, the tendency was to take those people and to have reliable um, loyal members of the state who practice that same occupation. Those families were then in authority over enslaved persons coming from endogamous castes. Okay, so the person was constantly being pushed into communities like communities where they could continue to practice those crafts. Okay, so an endogamous group member or a casted person, a Nyamakala, is identifiable by their patronym, okay, by their last name, by their family name, and they have defined occupational roles and social responsibilities. They marry within their own subgroups, and there are these subcategories within the Nyamakala. Okay, now a lot of the research that we have in this region is in French. Okay, so some of my sources were, are coming from the, the uh, African scholars uh, that were published in French. Okay, the Numu. The Numu, among the Numu, the blacksmith group, uh, the males, and you see some here, you know, uh, forging, a tool of some kind, they're hammering some kind of tool. Um, they are the iron and metal workers. Okay, and sometimes you'll find like uh, Numumusa. Okay, you'll find their, their category as a part of their names. So you immediately know where they are. In addition, then you have their last names that identify that they are Numu. And everybody knows these names. Everybody knows these names, okay? The females within, among the, 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 the blacksmith group, the females are potters, okay? Because they are, are working with fire and all these different things. There are secret incantations that go along with the practice of blacksmithing. And they marry among one another because the secrecy of the practice itself demands that both males and females understand the occupation. 
you can you they wouldn't bring a grill in what do we call a grill or a jelly in to marry a numu no the role of the jelly is different okay the the role of the jelly as speakers as storytellers the numu would not want any of their secrets or their practices getting out of their particular society or ruining the forge Okay, so it, it's very important for them that they maintain, you know, this endogamous relationship. So Numu families marry among one another. Um, according to uh, Sori Kamara, Jean de Parole, we have um, the next group, the Karake. The Karake are male tanners and leather workers. You know, they work hides of various kinds and leather workers so um they have their particular group and again you know there are practices and secret uh things going on within the practice of that particular profession the other thing is that they they're dealing with blood it's a lot of bloody work there are um there are oral traditions that go back and and talk about how they became tanners and how they became separate from other people okay be, and so this this bloody work that they do is is their destiny the next group of nyamakalao would be the jelly or the jelly wu. as i said if i put a w there i can make it plural jelly wu. so we're talking about male and female bards storytellers praise singers or musicians Okay, mostly for the stringed instruments and stuff, they're largely male. But, you know, the women are, you know, beating their, their calabashes. Sometimes they're decorated with cowrie shells, or they could be tapping, you know, uh, a metal bell. Okay, so, the, you know, there are women that complement a largely male um, uh, musical group. Okay. And then finally, a, another group of so-called jelly but they have their own name they're called fina fina so these male singers uh deal with the cor with the quran with verses of the quran and so they come out very solemnly for weddings for funerals you know for anything uh that has a religious component where blessings are involved these are the people who will then um sit together sometimes overnight depending you know like the tabaski or the ramadan or you know these fina these are people who come and read verses of the quran or sing these verses of the quran okay so you have these different categories among the nyamakalao okay now um uh, one of the translations that i had for nyamakalao you know, people call them handlers of power. Handlers of power. Nyama, which could be translated as power. In some uh, groups, in some uh, literature, it's translated as garbage. Okay, and the kala is the handle. So these people are power handlers. Okay, and they each belong to their own group over which they control that power. Okay, so, um, you know, you'll have this, this breakdown of these uh, different categories within uh, the thing. So these are the keepers of, of history. All right, um, you know, so it's important to understand that no matter where these people travel, within the region that by their last names people know them they know them so here are a few common clan names belonging to the jelly group and i'm just going to read them here very slowly i didn't want to produce another slide with this and this is not all of them believe me not all of them but as you read it would be good to to have an idea of them because when you read your oral oral traditions your oral histories your praise poetries and such when you see these names, you understand who these people are. 
Okay, so Bayo. Jawara. Ja was a location. So Jawara. You know, so someone, you know, these patronyms originated uh, from that particular group in that location. The Jabate. The Kante. The Keita. The Koita. The Konde. The Kuruma. The Kuyate. Okay, so these are all different family names. So when you hear that name, you understand immediately the tradition from which they come. And interestingly, you know, the way these things carry over in contemporary society, if you're looking for a master of ceremonies, you're going to go find someone with one of these patronyms. Why? Because they have the gift of speech. They know how to speak, how to embrace an audience. It's part of what they, they, they learn growing up. So if they um, were attentive as they were growing up to learn, you know, how to do these things, then um, uh, they, they, and you know, it's the kind of thing they, they don't resent it because they understand who they are. The entire society understands who they are. And no one is diminished in these relationships because everyone is essential. Everyone is essential. Okay, so number four. Well, that's good. So what can, that's really nice to know. What can we yeah. learn? What can we learn from the praise, po uh, praise poetry, mythical narratives, hunter tradition? All of these are part of the corpus yeah, yeah. That's okay. of oral traditions that undergird and capture the ideological foundation and mores of African cultures. This particular slide to the right is a, a Numa woman, Numa Muso. How do we know? Because she's working with pottery. Okay, she is making the, the, the pots. And so after she uh, makes her clay pots and they'll take them outside, they'll dry them a little bit, take them outside, burn them. Okay, because, you know, uh, this particular group actually got a kiln from the Canadians. But uh, for these smaller things, they'll still take the pots outside and burn them. Okay, but here, here she is. So importantly, one must understand that the pool of culture out of which orality is produced is not static. African societies change like all other societies. Any society that does not change will die. Okay, so when we use the word tradition, you know, we have to ask the question, tradition from when? Or what does this word actually mean in terms of practice? Okay, when, when uh, you know, I'm talking to some young men, they say, well, in our tradition, women didn't do this or that. Okay, I have to understand why he's evoking the word tradition. Okay, so that word tradition generally has um, been an impediment in some ways, but uh, no one has figured out a way for us to get away from the use of, of this word. Okay, um, endogenous knowledge. What is endogenous knowledge and where are we now? And, and this comes from uh, Polan Tunji and a group of researchers that he put together to produce this, this work called Endogenous Knowledge Research Trails. Um, and he uh, criticized severely the use of the word indigenous. He found the word indigenous as otherizing. Okay, so let's see what he has to say here. Um, endogeny, therefore, is not necessarily static. It can be dynamic. Maybe there is, after all, no absolute interiority, nor an absolutely first origin. Maybe one is rather a witness to a never ending movement of interiorization and appropriation of values derived from elsewhere. Okay, so what he's suggesting here, and I think this morning when someone asked about the use of the Indian word G and it being the same among the Songhai, okay, so what he's suggesting here is that at every stage, that Africans are adapting and appropriating and using things that are and incorporating things that are useful for them. So the society is constantly changing. So when we talk about endogenous knowledge, these are things that have been around long enough for people to make it their own. So as the second quote here says, one will therefore describe as endogenous in a given cultural setup 
Such knowledge as is experienced by society as an integral part of its heritage, in contrast to exogenous knowledge, which is perceived at this stage at least as an element of another value system. Okay, so if we're talking about endogenous, okay, it's ways, it's where the culture is at the time in terms of what they have accepted. Okay, think about Islam. Now I've been showing you pictures of the Islamic group at Man Jana in Northwestern Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, those people are largely Islamic now. They weren't when the first uh, Muslims came into the region. Okay, but they're largely Islamic now and they have incorporated somehow uh, the ancestral practices with many of the Islamic practices. So their endogenous framework incorporates Islam. Okay, so um, think about that then as, as you're reading. It's not that something doesn't belong there. It's, it's like, at what time did that become a part of the culture? We can do what we call in uh, history, problematize things that don't seem to fit. Because by problematizing, the issue, it means that we can go and study it and find out. Okay, now in, in this um, slide, because we're talking about what can we learn from these oral histories, um, musical lyrics, and tradition. Okay, now um, I know that Isata tried to address some of this uh, this morning with regard to the Sunjata epic. I had also identified just a little segment there um, from Stephen Belcher's work uh, where, and I, and I wanted to call attention to this because in my own research, I had also encountered this. Okay, so Sunjata's victory as a leader guaranteed his mother's renown. You know, when we talk about gender relations, how do women in this time frame make themselves famous? How do they become known? They become known by having successful children. Because when a child is successful, then the mother's name goes forward with the child's name. Okay, Sunjata, it's not just the name. The Sun part comes from his mother's name, Sogolo. His name, Jara, in this case, written Jata, okay, meant lion. So here we're talking about the lion son of Sogolon. The lion son of Sogolon. Okay. So in this particular uh, segment, uh, Sogolon's mother, Sogolon, Sunjata's mother, rejoices and sings with other women after Sunjata, and who had been crippled, who was you know a crippled, frail child when suddenly he stands with her assistance. So from this moment and the events that follow, Sunjata rises to assume his destiny. Mothers do everything possible, and we know this mothers, right? Mothers do everything possible to ensure their children's success. And don't forget, in these periods, we're talking about a polygynous society. So in the grand courtyard, you have each mother with her own hut where she sleeps with her children at night. And this is something I learned in, in my field work, okay, where I had, you know, a traditionalist, you know, tell me, say, listen, a lot of what's happening is going on in the mother's hut. The mother's hut. This is where she preps her children. This is where she teaches them to stick together. This is where uh, she's telling her sons to go out and make themselves famous because her name goes forward with them. Okay, so remember, we have to understand the context. These are polygynous families. The wives are in competition with one another and so are the children. Okay, so Sunjata's victory as a leader guarantees his mother's renown. Now, uh, let's look at what emerges in this account. Um, and so here you, you have Badinya, the Ba from the word mother, Dan from the word child, 
yeah, it's a state of, a state of mother childness. So although you have mother son bonding reflected in this, this word connotes solidarity. And in, in the accounts that I collected, whenever anyone wanted to talk about how community came together, they would use the word badenya. So it, it's an ideological term that doesn't just indicate that particular thing, but like I told you in the beginning, words are icons. They're full of explanation. So this term badenya, as soon as someone says it in the society, everyone understands that they're talking about solidarity, that they're talking about community. Okay, the opposite of that is fa dinya, fa father, den child, dinya, the state of father childness. This term represents chaos and disruption. Okay, so children of the same father, but different mothers, were generally known to be highly competitive, particularly the, the, the young men. And that was something for a long time, you know, people always talk about internecine warfare. For the longest time, I didn't understand it until I was introduced to these concepts during my research. Internecine warfare. And I'm always saying, well, why should brothers be fighting? Okay, this explained to me why that happens and how it happens. So whether I was looking at some kind of a contemporary report about some of these brother who was competing in power, you know, for to become head of state or, you know, some, some, even some other part of, I said, hmm, I wonder if those people have these same relationships, you know, where children of the same father can be in competition, but chances are they don't have the same mother. Okay, so I just wanted to sort of uh, pull that out as, as concepts. Okay, now we have a tendency to go around reaching for Western concepts to explain things. Well, what if we took these African concepts and laid them over, you know, European history to explain things? Okay, so, you know, what I'm advocating for here is that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Africans have a right to their own explanations of what they do and how they do it. All right, so the last slide here is how is our understanding of African cultures enhanced, okay, by accessing these myths and legends and lyrics? You know, what is personhood? What is agency? What do African voices have to say? Okay, so here we, you know, I, I this is from my own research, um, from a work that was attempting to understand uh, slave relationships within African communities. You know, because we're always looking at, you know, slave trade and this kind of thing. Uh, this particular uh, volume was attempting to understand slave relationships within Africa. So I wanted to share just this one piece with you. Uh, Chekama says we go hand in hand. If someone like him is not there, the freeborn becomes a slave. Sogona Koma says we go hand in hand. The day he is no longer, the freeborn becomes a slave. All right. So. Uh, Chekoma, Sogonakoma. Okay, these are the same people. Chekoma was a very powerful warrior. And he was able to conquer a great deal of territory for his master. Okay, a freeborn kingmaker. And so this song emerged. And uh, I actually have the music to this, this song. When I publish this, I'll publish the um, bars of music along with it. Um, so Chekoma, this is a song that emerged in his, around him, that the freeborn are dependent upon the slaves who help them fight their battle. Okay, and this can go back to where I laid out the different um, classes within society. Your freeborn, your Yamakarao, and your jom, your slave, enslaved persons. Okay, they are interdependent. Okay, and most of the people that live in these societies know that. So, you know, they may have what we call joking relationships where they might tease one another for certain characteristics, you know, relevant to their particular uh, place in society. But, you know, these are called joking relationships. Okay, because 
everybody knows if anybody takes it seriously, then the entire society could break down. Okay, so look at the way Chekoma's name, Che means man, Che Koma. His name is Koma. And Koma is um, kind of a secret uh, cult that exists in this region of the world for, for men's initiations. But look at the way he's called in the second part. Sogona Koma. Sogona is his mother's name. So her name, because he was such a powerful warrior, even though he was enslaved, his name goes forward with his mother's name. Sogona says we go hand in hand. The day he is no longer, okay, the freeborn become a slave. So in other words, freeborn peoples could be captured and made slaves if their powerful slave warriors did not help them fight their battles to help them lead their conquests. Okay. Uh, okay, so look to the right here. The, the photo you have there is the forge. These are men working the forge uh, up in northwestern Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, so I need chat. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of the presentation for today. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tungara, for that wonderful and deep presentation. And uh, now we're going to ask uh, if uh, uh, Dr. Helen Bond to uh, moderate again the Q and A. Thank and, you, uh, Jean. If you can uh, stop sharing, then we can. Great, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we have some really great questions around that presentation, Dr. Tungara. Thank you. To begin, which Arab Islamic scholars wrote negatively about Africans? I'm very curious because all the documentation I am familiar with, uh, those wrote very highly of Africans. Asking you to explain the discrepancy that they perceive. Um, I don't think you can say negatively of Africa because then you're putting a value judgment on it. Some of the reality of uh, the of African situations uh, in history might be um, perceived as negative. But I mean, you know, look at Chinua Achebe's work. I mean, many of you have probably already taught things fall apart. Okay, so those descriptions uh, are very human in terms of human responses to either, you know, the, the limitations of tradition at a time when society was changing. Um, so, you know, I don't, uh, I don't think that self-critique is definitely, is um, necessarily negative. Okay, look at Wole Shenka's work. He's very critical uh, of Nigeria, very, very critical of some of the responses of, of Nigerian in their own history. Now, does that mean it's negative or does an African scholar have a right to self-critique? Okay, so I don't know if that answers the question, but... Um, yeah, I think uh, they're referencing Arab Islamic scholars as well. Oh, uh, now the Arabic scholars, if we talk about them, right. They are viewing African societies through their own lenses as Arab Muslims. So then you have uh, cultural conflict. Okay, when they're looking at Black Africans that are non-Muslim in the time where Arabs were making their first contacts in the Western Sahel, their first contacts with African, with Black people, with Sudanic people, Black people. Okay, and then uh, communicating representations about these people because they weren't Muslim. Okay, so yeah, so, you know, those, many of those were, many of those were negative. So when we use those sources, we have to understand that context and push back on those sources. Okay, one of the things that's clear, you know, if you're using uh, Van Sina, Jan Van Sina, uh, as, as the framework for how to go about collecting and interpreting oral traditions. You know, once you, you get somebody, get a story, you know, we have an obligation to cut and cross cut bef and before we make any particular kinds of analyses, you know, of those sources. So, you know, if you're talking about Islamic scholars looking at, at Black Africa, again, to cut and cross cut. Um, Leo Africanus was one of those who had written a, a great deal. What did we find out later? P 
people found out in later scholarship that he wasn't even in the places that he said he was making those observations for himself. That his observations were, were based on traders that he was meeting outside of the region. So, you know, this is the kind of um, challenge that we have as historians to constantly interrogate the sources. We have to do that. We have to interrogate the sources. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, is there a ratio of Haram freeborn nobles to Nimakala as percentage of the population? Um, I can't answer that question. I can't answer that question. But if I can elaborate a little bit further on the ways in which people lived in these early times, there's something called the Kabila, K A B I L A, the Kabila, um, which can be translated as the quarter or the neighborhood. Okay. And every particular group had its own Kabila, its own neighborhood. Even if you look at early Wagadu, you know, um, uh, the archaeologists there have been able to sketch out the neighborhoods in which people lived because all the blacksmiths lived in the same neighborhood. Most of the jelly would lived in the same neighborhood. Okay. So most of the tanners lived in the same neighborhood, the tanners and the woodworkers, because don't forget that uh, uh, the skins uh, that the, the tanners cleaned uh, were sometimes used to cover the woodworking. Okay, so whether you're talking about the cora or a knife handle, you know, so those, those people kind of live sort of near each other in the same kabila. Okay, so when you have gatherings of the families, you know, you're calling in representatives, the patriarchs from the different kabila to, to sit together and to uh, make certain kinds of decisions. Sometimes the horon will call them together, the horon, whoever the, the king or chief is, you know, so that you have this, this, this meeting of, of patriarchs. And as they identify themselves, even the representative of the junk, the representative of the, the slave areas, Okay, that warrior, you know, will come into certain meetings and be consulted. Okay, so I mean, it's, it's very stratified, it's very hierarchical also. I mean, everyone understands their place and they all understand their interdependence. Thank you. Before we go to the next question, were they living together by, by choice or by force? By practice. Okay. By practice. By practice, thank you. Uh, next question. How static was, is the social system? How much was made static or incorrectly noted down by colonial census systems, like in India, which uh, with the caste system? Uh, questioner is thinking of the sanitization caused in colonial India. Um, as, as we move towards urbanization, as people move out of the countryside into urban en environments, um, you know, they may, you know, migrate towards, you know, areas where they know people and chances are they're, you know, part of a same, you know, series of patronyms that may practice the same kind of things. Okay, it's, it's like when we had the great migration here. What do people do is, as people left the south, they went towards those urban areas where they had relatives. Okay, and they went to those neighborhoods and lived near them. Okay, so uh, I, the, the colonial experience um, did not speak to that. Okay, the colonial experience did not speak to that. People um, had their, you know, their own societies and they used their, their social networks to survive colonialism. So um, they, they weren't going about trying to, to break them down. Now the missionaries tried to break them down. The other thing is that Islam was kind of a, an equalizer. And also the hunter traditions, you know, the men who became hunters, you could be from any one of those groups and your status in a hunter association was based purely upon your seniority, the time at which you entered the hunter association. So for example, if a 15 year old boy entered the hunter association three or four years before you know, a 30 year old man, that 15 year old had superiority and authority over that 30 year old man within the hunter association. So you see each one of these groupings 
has its own rules. I call it an equalizer because anyone from those categories could become uh, a member of the Hunter Association. Anyone from those categories could embrace Islam. Okay, so, and then so the, the judgment for those who became Muslims, regardless of which um, class of society to which they belong, if they were a sincere Muslim scholar and productive as an Islamic scholar, they gained the respect and they gained a following. So Islam, Islam was kind of a, a leveler in certain cases uh, in, in, as, it, as it came on. Thank you. Next question. In reference to the idea of endogenous, how do scholars tackle influence? Is influence just as alienating a concept as indigenous? Uh, I didn't see anything about uh, influence uh, being alienating in, in what I was reading from uh, Huntonji and his group of, of scholars. Um, um, I don't know, for comparison, perhaps, I remember when I went to Australia, and, you know, we, in going, when you go to Australia, you deal with the term uh, Aborigines, okay? That's like using the term, you know, for Huntonji, that's like using the term Indigenous. Okay, there's an otherizing uh, aspect of that, so that no matter how accomplished people can become, they remain othered. Okay, and his attempt with endogenous knowledge was to give Africans the parameters to grow and to embrace, you know, whatever contacts they come in, uh, in uh, into and to add those things onto their own development and advancement. So it becomes part of, it's not just indigenous, you know, like a specific set of things that people from a very particular region can do and cannot do. To be endogenous embraces what Vancina referred to as that pool, that pool of culture, you see, so that it, it's growing and expanding as cultures grow and expand. Thank you. We actually had another question around that. And so you, you sort of enveloped that. The other question was, can you say more about <clears throat> the distinction between uh, endogenous versus indigenous, and you just did, so thank you for that. Uh, with respect to societies and development, is there a leaning towards uh, Bandinia or Fadinia, or are they sort of sought uh, to find balance, such as yin and yang? A couple of our questions. Yeah, you, you might look at it like that, because whenever you have a case of Fadinia, and you have Fadinia when you have kingdom expansion, when you have war, when you have uh, territorial conquest and all of that. Okay, well, once you have that, then there's a swing back where people um, strive to achieve that solidarity and that peace that they need in order to carry on, to be economically productive for their families to grow. Okay, Thanks. and so that fadanya, that chaos, that, that knocks you know, a, a, a people out of its stasis, giving them opportunities to do new things. And then you know, once they have that expansion, then once again, there's the badinya, that, that effort to achieve solidarity, to make amends, to, to somehow uh, find a place for, for peoples, new peoples that have been brought in to the, the, the state or the kingdom. Okay, so yeah, so there's, there's, uh, there's a swing there. That was a good observation and a good question. Thank you. Um, there's a question around adoption <clears throat> and the caste groups. Does adoption change these caste group statuses for an individual or was adoption rare or somehow limited? Okay, well, I've, I've never heard the, the term adoption uh, used for a person in, in African societies. Um, uh, generally, people who are from those those uh, patronyms that that practice certain occupations, you know, they even if the person had been enslaved, like conquered during war, like if a village is 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 conquered or a set of villages are conquered, and you have blacksmiths among them, okay, then the 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 conquering king 
would give instructions for those uh, conquered, let's say they were blacksmiths, to be brought to the blacksmithing families that are loyal to him. And they would be uh, managed by the blacksmith patriarch, okay, in that Kabila. Or, you know, if it's a larger area, you know, you may have blacksmithing villages. Like if you want to, you know, have a, you know, go find a pot, you know, an iron pot, you know, you're going to go to the blacksmith's village to find that. You're just not going to be wandering around saying, oh, you know, you know, you're going to go. I mean, now you can go to markets and find those things. But, you know, these things are, are, are made, you know, in those neighborhoods or, or in these earlier times, sometimes even a separate village where all the Numu live and work together. So, uh, you know, the word adoption, I, I've never been exposed to the word adoption as it pertained to persons. Okay, these people would be literally assigned to work under the authority of a patriarch among the blacksmith families loyal to the state. A question, because we don't have any more questions, but a question that that raised for me, if someone is in one caste group and they find out that they're not a very good blacksmith, can they change caste? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Otherwise, it wouldn't be no, a caste. You're no, you're born into it. You're born into it. You've got okay. your family name and you can't escape it. Right. And so if someone wants to see some good movies, uh, Usman Simbin, before his death, did it several good movies that talk about the, the challenges in contemporary society of, of people, and I think Isotun mentioned this, of people marrying, you know, because young people meet in these urban environments, you know, so of young people marrying outside of their, uh, the caste into which they were born, or the endogamous groups into which they were born, and the, 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 the challenges and disruption that brings to families. Okay, great. Uh, near perfect timing. At 12.10, we go to our breakout, and it's 12.09, so I'll let Brenda or Vanessa, thank you, Dr. Chungara, for okay, a Okay, thank you, everybody. There. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, now that uh, Jamie is going to uh, put us into breakout groups so that we can share uh, our presentations from uh, about the Gold Road or from the Gold Road. Yes, yeah, so please just pay attention. I'm going to click the button now and you'll be prompted to click to join the breakout room.
Hi, um, some of you all joined after I created the you you all um, readmitted yourselves after I created the breakout rooms and there is no way for me to um, add you to a room now. I'm looking to see if that's possible and I can't add you to a room. Let me see here. I might be able to. But if you were in the room, you should have a, please look for the, you should, hi, Kathy, you should get a um, pop-up box as, that prompted you um, close out everything on your screen. I mean, by close out, just minimize it to see if that pop-up box came, but you should be added to a room if you never left. Because you're not popping up on my, uh, I see that there's an uh, unassigned list and you're not popping up on there, so. So for those who have not Okay, are we all I think we're all back here. Wonderful. Uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, share the go your go road connection. We had two very, very wonderful presentations in our breakout group, and I hope that they will share, but I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bond because she's going to help to moderate this. Yes, I just had a question before we start the moderation. Do you want them just to share, uh, not certainly via chat, I don't think, but just to speak or share screen? How would you like that, Brenda? Um, well, I think maybe just speaking from here. Well, uh, um, and I, if Jamie wants to spotlight the person that's speaking, that's fine. Um, okay. Yeah, okay, that, that's great. Cause you know, you haven't been able to sort of hear yourself speak or, or, uh, directly. So let's start out with a um, couple of options here. Uh, you certainly shared in your small groups, you know, what excited you, what you felt you could contribute to the classroom. Um, and so we'd like to take that to the larger group. You heard what you said in the smaller group. Uh, you can also add, and I added, at least in my small group, uh, I asked the question, did you have any misconceptions as teachers that when you attended the Institute or that the goal road map helped to spell that you can take back to the classroom. So we'll take volunteers. Thank you. Who would like to share to the whole group? Anyone would like to share their? Uh, uh, Karen Brown, I'll share something. Thank Not you, exactly funny, but I've never had it. Um, clear in my brain where one hump camels and two hump camels are. So I think I finally got it. So it's a, it's not a small thing in this topic, but my kids that I teach, which are very young, will love learning the difference. <laughs> Wonderful, great. Anything others would like to share, what they found interesting on the map, unique, raise questions or any misconceptions? 
that you may have brought that may have been dispelled or misconceptions that you may deal with your students that the goal roadmap would also help dispel. Any of those are open. I'd like to make a comment, please. Yes, Thank please. you. Yes, uh, with my group. Um, our focus was very interesting because we looked at specifically the objects, trade items on the map. We were talking about economics and value and how the value of gold, the value of several objects sort of change over time. Looking at how we can get students to think more critically about these objects in their various ways. Um, focusing on why students would pick certain objects and sort of comparing those objects with the objects of today value-wise. Learning how to juxtapose the values of yesterday's objects with today's objects and contemporary um, ideals. and. Um, looking at relevance and um, and how we can maintain the relevance of these objects, but more so in understanding. So there was an economic, uh, uh, I think, focus in our discussion. If, if Jaleel is um, available, he please unmute yourself and please um, talk a little bit more about what you were saying in the group because what you were saying was truly magnetic as well as Edith, please unmute yourself as well. And, you know, feel free to say something about what, you know, you were saying about objects and identity and how we can, it doesn't have to be just an African perspective on how we see these objects, but we can make it um, less one dimensional. And so I, I thought, our group discussion was really fantastic. So, so you called out Jaleel <laughs> and Edith. Good afternoon, everyone. Peace and, peace and love. So um, briefly, I was mentioning how as we go through the gold map, we look at the different tribes, how they're connected and interconnected. That first, one way we could use it is interdisciplinary. So that, for instance, example, when Mansa Musa went through, have students do experiential exercises. How would, you know, being within that function, how, how they're going about their day, and then all of a sudden you have this major influx of gold coming into your city, your town. How does it affect you, your business, your gold, your family, your livelihood? If you're those who are coming there, how does it affect you? How does it affect your, affect your government? And so as they go through the trail, they're able to build their own understanding and, and, and scaffold uh, on what was being experienced as these things happen. I talked very quickly and briefly about uh, Sundiata and, and, and how the different caste systems were and, and how people could, as they go down uh, through the road and they have different uh, people, different places and castes, how would they connect or interconnect and then have a inter -ex uh, experiential exercise where they're a different cast. How are those casts interacting? How is it um, being affected when people come through and pass through? And, um, and Miss Either made a great connection to that where, oh, and I can let her talk about it, but I'm gonna say just for my part that I, I talked about how um, different things can be taken and use and, and, and held on to, and, and, and we get a deeper in-depth connection to it. And then they, they create something that shows how each of these are connected, how they're um, related to one another and, and how they come to know one another through um, their knowledge, through their trading, through their language, whether it's through their, you know, uh, you know as it was talked about by our speakers. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a yield to Miss Edith. Well, I don't have much more to add, except that uh, I enjoyed the conversation in our group. Um, we wanted to just personalize sort of the exercise. Maybe have the kids think about a piece of artwork as an heirloom piece and, and track its travel from, you know, that time to you, you know, uh, across the ocean and everything else. And, and they could then bring up a number of factors around you know, uh, the value of it uh, as, it, as a transition um, or, or how it transformed, all kinds of things. That's the only thing I would add. I really enjoyed our group. <laughs> Thank you. Are there others? Uh, yes, I would like to uh, say something. 
uh, I want to be, but it has to be seen or else this whole thing is going to be. Can you share your screen? Is that okay, uh, Brendan, Vanessa? I share, I clicked on share screen. That doesn't. Jamie, is he able to? Uh, yeah, Brooks he should, Goddard? He should be able to, uh, one participant at a time, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, where, where, how do I do that? Oh, but is it, are you, are you trying to show oh, us what's in your hand? Yes. We can oh, see oh, that. We okay. can see Okay, that. you can see this. Yes. Just okay, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, this is a piece of salt that I bought in Multi uh, Mali when I was in Mali. And the salt uh, crystal allows me, I have it, I have it by, in my, by my desk, and allows me not only to remember the wonderful time I spent in Mali, but also the way in which rock, uh, what way salt uh, features in the history of West Africa. So if, I were, so if I were to write a praise poem, I would write it about the salt and about the long history of, extra, of discovering, extracting, and using salt that still goes on. I can still see the, the river, the side of the river, and this guy lying in the shade, and all those slabs of salt. And I'm saying, my God, 2000, this was 2009, and this has been going on for at least 2,000 years. That's it. Thank you, Brooke. Anyone else? Can I um, read an excerpt of my praise poem? Absolutely. So um, my name's Tamina Khan. Um, I'm a uh, English and creative writing teacher in San Francisco, um, community college level, and, uh, and I'm a poet. This is a poem, a praise poem for my grandma. Um, so um, I'll, I'm, I'm reading from the middle, so. Shopping was her game, bargaining was her fame, in the bazaars of Hyderabad, in the Kmarts of USA, in the shopping malls of Saudi Arabia. Oh, the shiny, beautiful things, silk saris, glass bangles, oh my. Oh, the utilitarian, mundane things, hair clips, socks, soaps, and shampoo. Oh, the decadent things, perfume and gold earrings. Oh yes, shopping was her game bargaining was her fame. In mango season, she held court, seated on a stool in the bazaar. Begum sahab, this one is sweetest, please taste. Begum sahab, this one is juiciest, please taste. Begum sahab, this one for amras, this one for, for custard, this one to squeeze and suck, acha. This one, not that, this one also. And pineapple too, it's the child's favorite. Oh yes, shopping was her game. Bargaining was her fame, amam. Afsalunisa Begum, the best of women, four feet nine, a giant among women. She loved a good wedding. Oh, yes, she did. Saris and jewels, music and mandy. Oh, the gossip. Oh, the tall tales. The ladies gathered round to hear her tell tales. The truth is bigger than the truth. Four feet nine, a giant among women. She spoke Urdu, Telugu, and English, and she prayed in Arabic. Yes, she did. Prayed she would not outlive her children. Prayed she would not die in foreign. Allah accepted one prayer but not the other. Allah knows best. Yes, Allah knows best. And it's longer, it keeps going on. But That was beautiful. Yeah. Let's all give her a hand there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> snaps, snaps. <laughs> yeah, snaps. That was fantastic. Yes. Wow, that was great. So, if we want to go from Shakespeare to practically nothing, um, I wrote a praise poem to the um, music of Copacabana for Professor Chom. <laughs> I don't know if I can, um, I don't know if Professor Chom probably doesn't remember this, but 10 years ago, I went on a Fulbright Hayes to Senegal with him, and he's one of my favorite people in the world. So um, I don't know, do, is everyone okay if I, in my horrible voice, sing my song? Yes, 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 please. Yeah, go for it. Yes, I seriously please. don't know uh, if I can do it. this without either laughing or crying. Um, okay. 
All right, here we go. Professor Chong, this is for you. <laughs> His name is Mbai. He's a professor who made a difference in my life. His impact was quite divine. He loved his movies, showed us Fakine about a female heroine who succeeds in spite of men. That was 10 years ago. He might forget it though. A Fulbright haze to Senegal who could ask for more. He's a doctor, degree in awesome, helps love of the continent blossom. He's a teacher, leads by example. And just like Sunjata, he's well liked and smart. Yeah, there's no one like Professor Chom. Doctor, <laughs> degree and awesome. We went to Dakar and then St. Louis. We ate a ton of jollof rice. The whole trip was quite nice. And they say wisdom is like the baobab. And not just for one of us to hold, it's for all young and old. And this is what he knew. He will teach you and you. There is no one around quite like him, but just who's this cool? He's a doctor, degree and awesome. Helps love of the continent blossom. He's a teacher, leads by example. And just like Sunjata, he's well liked and smart. Yeah, there's no one like Professor Chom. Doctor, degree Thank and you. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, very nice. <laughs> so, um, love, yeah. love, love it. I'll email it to him. There's another stanza, but that's I awesome. Be there he goes, Dr. Chom. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Chom's still with us? Oh, yes, he is. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, thank you, Dr. Chom. Thank you. Get a Jeff. Get a Jeff. Get a Jeff. <laughs> Get a Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> I have something to share. My name is Terry Thomas, and I wrote a praise sensory poem. And um, with our senses, we feel, we see, we hear, we touch, we smell. So the student would write a, if I were doing this in the classroom, the student would write a sensory poem describing one artifact from the Gold Road Project. The artifact that I chose to write about today is the gold nugget. I am a nugget of gold traveling by caravan across the Sahara. I feel weathered, rough, rugged, and worn. I see reflections of my brilliance illuminating across the riverbed of mud rich and deep okra. I hear tools tapping, scraping, and digging for my obscure and elusive deposits. I touch rock, sand, gravel, and water, extracting my dust as I hide embedded in the earth's sediment. I smell the metallic sweat, human exhaustion, and baby scent as I rest upon the back of the weary mother. I am almost invisible, though so I am a prominent curator of people, culture, and religious beliefs. I am power. I am the gold nugget. So in this exercise, the student would choose their, use their senses in creating the poem. And they could, uh, if it's a lower elementary student, they could just use one word to describe that particular sense. Or it's, if it's an upper elementary or middle school or even high school, they could use a phrase or a um, sentence to describe the point. Mm. Love it. Fantastic. Good idea. Love it. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you Thanks, very much Terry. for sharing. Any other praise poems or praise songs? This is Karen, I'd love to share. Please. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and go very quickly. Um, I teach a lot of uh, visual arts and bookmaking to young children ages two and a half um, through elementary and sometimes uh, middle, uh, upper, uh, middle school and high school and 
teachers and let me just move this. Um, I painted a large piece of watercolor paper on two sides in half in the curves to emulate the sand dunes, put the two ends, the short ends together to make an accordion book. Can you see this okay? Yeah. Great. Yes. And then uh, I drew um, camels, just used um, imagery from the web and um, glued them onto paper bags. I'm big recycler. And one light side can be the sand dunes during the day. And then our facilitator helped me realize that the darker side not only could be night, but it could also be the rocky Sahara. And these camels are not glued on yet, but I have um, very narrow sticks that I could put them on and kids could use this as a puppet show or as a stationary piece of art and then put a little bit of textile on their necks for textiles and I'll add people and more camels. So it's a very simple book structure that um, any age can do from three years on up through college and, and teachers. So it was a great, great fun. Very adaptable. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. Could I uh, encourage someone to share? Um, in our group, uh, Megan Crowell shared a piece um, where she was able to connect um, the current pandemic situation to the concept of community. And I thought that was very beautiful. I'd love to hear that. Is Megan there? Uh, let me search through the gallery view here. I do see Megan Crowell, but she's uh, she's on mute. Um, well, Kelly, would you share from our group because, and maybe you could share your screen as well as we wait for Megan. Sure, if you want me to. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, give me just one second. Would you like me to play the music in the background this time? Or I think I got it up in the background that I can play as well. Hi, I'm uh, Kelly Davis Bach. I wrote a praise poem for my group. I'm gonna play a little bit of music in the background. Uh, too loud and you'll be able to hear me. Yep, gotta get it down there. All blessings for my children. Do a feed bit baby. Little boss, here are my hopes for you. May you hear the beauty in Pular, the comfort of Jamtum, peace only, because there's no trouble there. The greetings, the jokes, the proverbs, connecting past, present, and future across space and time to your family, your name to you, Mama Jan Abdullahi Mariama Bapulo. May you know the beauty of Guinea, of fluted yellow soaring mountains and roaring waterfalls, source of great rivers, great wealth, great empires, of Medina's trees full of the sweetest oranges you've ever tasted, grown by the sweetest cousins you've never met, a home where you are always missing but always missed. Mama Jan Abdullahi Mariama Bapulo. May you have the wisdom, spirit, and strength of your tokoras, your namesakes, your grandfathers, your aunts, your cousins. May you know the power that lives inside you that others can't see, like Sogolan and Sunjata, unlikely heroes who, when life seemed impossible, hope lost, obstacles too great, continued, survived, 
deprived because you only stumble if you're going somewhere. Mama Jan Abdullahi Ariyama Papulo. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. It's beautiful. I think Megan said she was going to uh, present or share. Yeah, sorry, my Zoom froze as soon as she said my name, so <laughs> maybe it's trying to scare me off or something. Um, so our group was looking at architecture, and uh, I was just um, thinking about how some of the buildings, uh, like the SAR Training Center in Morocco and the Dejani Mosque with the market around them were so communal. Um, and I, it made me think a lot about how um, disconnected we are as a community. Um, so that's what I wrote mine. Hopefully you'll be able to hear me clearly. Um, and this is to my children. You walk six feet away, saying a quick greeting, if anything, mask on, head down, just getting the essentials done. But don't forget that this is temporary, an act of current isolation to build community. A thread usually breaks where it's thinnest. So let's do our best to weave ourselves together in solidarity so we can all come out stronger. My children remember, we were made for community. You play games with siblings, missing the ruckus of recess. Same games, same faces, just focusing on the blessing till this is done. But don't forget that this is temporary, a current act of family solidarity to build community. Sticks in a bundle are unbreakable, so let's do our best to build ourselves together like the walls at Degene in solidarity so we can all come out stronger. My children, remember, we were made for community. You read about friendships, watch a movie, seeing friends laugh and play and work together. Heart full, plans ready, just waiting to plan and build and dream with others. But don't forget that this is temporary, a current act of social deprivation to build community. Two are better than one. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. So let's do our best to unite ourselves together in solidarity so we all come out stronger. My children remember, we were made for community. Thank you, that was beautiful. There is a, also with archeology, span there was a, a Kelly in our group. So maybe she would like to share. And Alicia, she did a wonderful job as well. You there? Which of us do you want to go first? It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Whoever's up, that's good. Go ahead, Alicia. Okay. Um, so I, I based mine on um, the Tuareg uh, tent poles that are on the website. Um, if you go look for them, um, they're from the mid 20th century. Um, but it turns out that they're actually uh, part of a mother's creation of a tent for her daughter um, that happens across the daughter's childhood. Um, so I kind of related this to what we learned about uh, women being involved in trade, um, but also uh, kind of became a, a praise song for my mother. So a uh, praise song for a mother preparing her daughter's tent. When they laid the newborn on your breast, they told you the hard work was done, but you knew it had just begun. Mother is a verb, not a noun. A mother will labor for a lifetime, not hours. When she was so small, you were her first shelter, her face in the cloud of your hair, her feet tucked along your ribs. But all too quick, she would leave you and need a tent of, your, of her own. You began. When you worked 14 hour days with iron and fire and words more dangerous than both, you were saying, I go to prepare a place for you. You were saying, I love you. The nursling cried as she marked her absence in hours, but a mother labors for a lifetime. When you chose the tent skins, you could not afford to reject those with blemish. 
you selected the strongest to keep out scorching sun and scouring sand. Then you mended breaks with your own hair. You continued. When you worked sun up to sundown in all manner of hostile spaces, places a black woman was simultaneously a threat and threatened, you were saying, I go to prepare a place for you. You were saying, I love you. The child sometimes pushed you away after she marked her absence in hours, but a mother labors for a lifetime. When you chose the tent poles, you did not always pick the lightest. Knowing from experience, they were often rotted at the core and would snap in a storm. You bore the weight of the heavy, strong poles to the desert for years. You persisted. When you worked with holes in your shoe soles and fresh stitches where your breast once was, working through your agony, you were saying, I go to prepare a place for you. You were saying, I love you. The young woman sought comfort in others as she marked her absence in hours, but the mother labors for a lifetime. When you gathered that which was within close reach and that which took you far away, your mind was on building the biggest tent for her, a shelter as big as the sky where she could dance her dreams without restraint. You finished. When you completed your daughter's tent and saw that it was good, then you rested with the book, saying, I go to prepare a place for myself. You were saying, I love you. You got this. The grown daughter marks your separation and prayers from a mother who has labored for a lifetime. That was beautiful. Wow. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share a praise song, praise poem, comment, question? I have a, this is Kalenda, I have a praise poem as well. Uh, we have a, a mother theme, I think, going on here. <laughs> um, but I was inspired uh, from yesterday. So I teach African American uh, history and literature and also uh, African diaspora and some um, West African. And so I'm always trying to make the connection between uh, for my students um, across the diaspora and also on the continent. And so with the praise poem, um, I did a bit of that um, with uh, starting each stanza with uh, four different proverbs that are supposedly from Mali, Songhai, and Ghana. Um, and then also um, invoking the jelly and the camels and um, this idea of migration and movement uh, and women's work as well. Um, and it is um, about, it's actually personal, it's actually about my great grandmother. Um, and I know four things about her. And so each stanza tells of one of those things. Okay, I'm sorry, that was a lot of context, but anyway. <laughs> um, an elegy for Hazel C and four acts. A good story is like a garden carried in the pocket. Let me tell you a tale of a woman known to many as Hazel C. She was the first born child of George and Georgia Ann grew up on a homestead and farmed the vast land. As a young woman, they say she felt tragedy. She is a stranger to you, but a foremother to me. First born, never torn, paved her way, vowed to stay in the place that was not her home. He kan ka bon futa nyaga, kulu guka bon kana nyaga. She was called to a place that would allow her to flee. A swift move with her little ones rounding out the load, so she packed up and began her long journey up the road. Once there, she heard talk of fiery days and what happened to Grand Wall Street. Still, she steadied her pace and rushed to embrace her sister, her dear family. First born, never torn, paved her way, vowed to stay in the place that was not her home. It is true that the camel will eventually die, but he will never stretch out and lay flat on his back. She listened to her soul deep inside and said, yes, this will be our new home. The children enjoyed the big town and streets filled with the community and love. She learned a trade and honed her craft, eventually feeling the sign of the dove. And the night opera sprang from her radio in tongues foreign and unknown. She married again before finally believing a soft te amo on the other end of the phone. 
First born, never torn, paved her way, vowed to stay in the place that was not her home. A child who asks questions does not become a fool. With the song of a jelly, I hold the past in my head and offer praise to the queens I cannot see. Her youngest child left to live a new life, but illness back home meant she could not stay. The girl cried and she prayed until mother's body was no more and her own hopes were dashed away. My mother's mother was that child and when I was young, she passed her dreams down to me. So I have now told you another tale that I also know well of the daughter of Hazel C. First born, never torn, paved her way, vowed to stay in the place that was not her home. Thank you. Nice. <clears throat> Do you have time for a father's praise? Yes. <clears throat> okay. All right. My French is terrible, but my father was French, so I try to throw it in. Canada South, your bride and me flew, giving up everything, the breast bed you were born on. To be called immigrant, not accept it, your ed education poo-pooed. But never did you complain or stress, not one bit. Stood strong, stood brave, just gave a cocky grin on one side of your face. Fedo do daddy, je temble mentef uvac. Daddy, my daddy, standing on your toes, we did dance. My first love, my hero, my secret keeper to the very last. Dancing lessons, guitar lessons, piano, hula too. Only my singing and tapping brought a disparaging view. Fedo do daddy, je t'aime plus, maintain ou vac. You worked two jobs to give me my dreams, left home to work, sleeping on the locker room floor if need be. You asked for so little, you gave so much. Your laughter filled the house, now it fills my heart. Fedo do daddy, je, je Tem pleur, maintain uvec. Las Vegas, the racetrack, we made, had a great time. I never got enough of you, time. I wanted you, time, so much more time. You taught me to laugh during hard times, to work through the pain, be loyal, honest, and accepting a friend to the end. Your music and art I still carry inside, being playful, unafraid to laugh at oneself. To you with this, I do repledge to write every night till my dreams come true or whatever might else. Fado do daddy, je t'aime plus, maintain uvec. Go to sleep, daddy. I love you more now than before. Except for the French. <laughs> uh, how much more time do we have? I'm going to defer to Brenda and Vanessa. Not I think sure it's about our time. Time to close. I wish we could. I could go on for hours, but I'm sure people have other commitments after one. So I think we we will have to end here, right, Brenda? Is Brenda here? Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to, yeah, yes. Uh, and uh, before we go, uh, just a couple of more things. And uh, I've thanked a lot of our, pre our presenters. I'm not sure I did thank uh, uh, Anya, who works with us, who is our media specialist, and she has done so much work for so many things to support this institute, to support the Gold Road. I just want to give a big shout out and a thank you to Anya. Yes, thank you, Anya. And also, uh, Pierre Pinnock, who was a breakout leader for some of you. Uh, she's our partner at the Smithsonian Museum of African Art. We wanna thank her for her support and uh, all that she has done um, to, to also to help make this uh, institute a success. Um, is there, did I, can, did I, oh, did Pierre take over? I think, <laughs> Pierre, we can't hear you. Peer? We can I peer? I wanted to sh quickly share the screen of the African Art Museum. Um, so many of the objects we talked about you can find in our collection. If you just go to africa.si.edu, you will, um, and let me make sure I have this. Uh, okay, this is the right one. Um, you'll see our webpage. 
And I just wanna quickly take you to exhibit. If you go to current exhibit, you'll see Caravans of Gold right here. If you click on that, it will take you to our Caravans of Gold website. And right here, I know it's a little bit small, but you'll see that it's divided into several different themes. You can click on any theme to see any types of artifacts. So we'll just start with Sahara Echoes as an example. And right there, it takes you with full museum labels and background information about various exhibits. You can also click on teacher's guide right here. And what that does is that will take you to the teacher's guide, which it takes a second to load up, but this gives you access to the entire teacher guide to our Caravans of Gold exhibit, which focuses a lot on the artifacts and the different cultures that we have discussed today. So there it is right there, the teacher's guide. I also quickly wanted to take you to the collections because our collections or base is based in the thousands. So in our collection section, you have everything divided into different exhibits, different themes, different categories. Specifically, um, well, there's so many of them. There's our heroes exhibit, which is pretty popular right now. And if I click on the heroes exhibit, what will happen is you'll see some of the pieces. I want to invite students to explore and, and of course, all of our instructors to explore and, re and, and utilize research on the museum website. And I also want to take you back to the home page. And uh, because of the wonderful poetry that was shared today, we have the winners of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art Poetry Contest that was announced today. And you can click here to read some of the winning poems. One of the first poems was a young man from Nigeria. And of course he uses, um, from an Akan artist, um, a, a piece from Ghana. And I thought that was amazing how this piece influenced him to write this poem on heroic empowerment. And there are other winners of the poetry up to high school that you'll be able to read. So that's all I wanted to show you. It is africa.si.edu, wonderful resource. You can, you can take hours to get through all of this, all of the pieces. So thank you very much. And to piggyback on, on Peer, thank you so much, Peer. Peer um, and the Smithsonian Museum of African Art uh, provided the certificates that we'll be sharing with you, the certificates of participation. So we shall send them to you uh, either later today or first thing in the morning, and we'll send you any other links that you may need or haven't, we, that we haven't shared so far. But thank you so much, Peer. Thank yeah. you for creating I, Thank you so much. And I just wanted to also share, tomorrow we have an open teen mic. Since we're discussing poetry, teens will be um, uh, sharing poetry tomorrow. We have six teenagers sharing poetry. And if you go to our website, you can click to register right here. It's tomorrow at six o'clock. We're in conjunction with Words, Beats, and Life. So that's from six to seven tomorrow. Six teens wrote dynamic poetry on African art. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. You're welcome. And um, Here we go. I'm adding the link as usual, the link to the evaluations in the chat box. Please make sure you write us and let us know how you enjoyed this day today. Uh, also, one more thing. Um, the recordings uh, for day one and day two are already on the Center for African Studies website. And Thank I will you. put uh, that link into the, into the chat as well. And hopefully day three will be up either today or tomorrow. Perfect. Uh, Vanessa, did you want to say something about the people who shared today and that they were recorded? Uh, is that out? Yes, right. So everyone that shared their poetry today, we would like to put this entire recording um, on, the on the website along with the other two days. And so we hope we have your permission to do that. Yeah, if not, then just, you know, let us know. We'll see what we can do to edit it out. But we hope that you'll let it stay. Yes. Thank you. You've been great troopers. You've been with us all the way. So um, thank you. Thank you.
And Thank stay tuned so for more on the Gold Road. There will be many more updates that are going to be amazing. And so please come back and check in on with the website. We'll have much more for you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I love, the, I love the praise portion of this. This was really my favorite part of the whole thing. I mean, it was amazing three days, but the praise was like, it got my heart. Thank you. It was wonderful to hear from you all. Yes. And I, I want to say that my son is an incoming freshman at Howard University. He's going to be at, ho at, at home in San Francisco online for, for now. But I cannot wait to, to be a part of this journey and to move him there and um, when, you know, when, we're, when it's safe to do so and, um, and connect with, with, with many of you. Uh, I'm so Absolutely. excited. Yeah, be sure that we're in the Bunch Center. Uh, the Bunch Center. Okay. Bunch Center. Send them to us. Okay. Right. I will.